Uh, welcome, everybody, to the Internet Society uh, Board of Trustees meeting number 176. Uh, we're starting today on November 11th in 2023. Uh, um, first, I must ask if anybody has any declarations of conflict of interest they need to declare for today's meeting. Uh, seeing none, uh, I think we can move on to the first item of business, which is to receive uh, community chair reports. And Cheryl, uh, let me congratulate you on your uh, re-election as a member of the steering committee and ask you to begin. Oh, thank you very much, Ted. And of course, we've still got that uh, small period where people could uh, make objections. So let's let's not, you know, we'll cool our heels until it's official. But I do hope I am returned because I would look forward uh, to working with the team um, in a second year. To be honest, one year is a very tiny amount of time um, for any sort of committee to work uh, when it really is only interacting with its community four times in that year. Um, and that's when it's running at at, uh, at full capacity, which we did do this year. Um, and uh, whilst that is reflected in our report, I would like to take the time just to remind the Board of Trustees that that is uh, not always the case, that uh, previous steering committees have in fact uh, dropped the ball on a number of their regularised meetings. Um, we have managed to keep up the pace um, to have our monthly meetings of the steering committee without missing a beat to have wedged in additional meetings for the leadership team because uh, certainly uh, the style the leadership team took was one of uh, collaborative agenda setting and to ensure that anything that had uh, perhaps come in through the box note systems that we set up and that we've reported on previously, and I have alluded to in, in this year-end report, um, if anything had gone into those, that we picked those up and would action them. So a week or 10 days, but usually around a week before our monthly meetings, we also held a, a check-in meeting, a, a preparatory meeting um, as well, just for the leadership team with staff. Um, and of course, we have performed all four of our expected quarterly meetings. And with this report, which is where I'd like to dig into in, in short order, um, we have done a little bit of an analysis, which I have been promising for some time uh, to the Board of Trustees. But strangely enough, this year, which has been, as I indicated in the report, an interesting one, um, there's been some sort of treacle-like delay, uh, things that should have got feedback in from community, we thought much faster have taken not, you know, one, two or three months, but four, five or six months. Um, we have been underwhelmed uh, by some of the engagement opportunities um, or the picking up of the engagement opportunities that we've offered. Um, that doesn't mean that they weren't bad ideas. It may be that there was other things happening. I'm sure you're all aware of some of them that may have occupied the um, leadership of chapters. There's been this little AMSE stuff going on um, and other compressed times that have been forced upon the chapter leadership because of uh, what's happened, what has had to happen. Um, but I, I do personally hope that some of those initiatives will continue on for a second year so we can see whether we can get some increased uptake. You do have a, um, a written report for your records and to some extent after the um, the politeness and the uh, uh, hail fellow well met and thanks to all and sundries at the beginnings, um, some of it is uh, in the start a reiteration and a reminder of various points that we've made in our previous far more brief reports. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions on any of that, of course, but what I'd really like to dig into is the analysis of the engagement we're having, not just with the initiatives we've tried out this year, with the various changes in the fold of structures, with opening up um, box notes and collaborative collaborative documentation to allow asynchronous interactions between the council, uh, the steering committee, and when something was merited um, to pass on to, to the board. Um, but 
we, whilst we were a little underwhelmed with some of that, we do recognise uh, change sometimes doesn't happen as fast as we'd like. And secondly, as I alluded to earlier, it has been an interesting year. But I thought you might be interested to look at a little bit of the analysis, and I draw your attention um, to uh, the bottom of page two of the five-page report, where we've done an analysis just for this year um, for the three Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Lauren. For the um, the three quarterly meetings we've held to date, our fourth quarterly meeting comes in at the, I think, 23rd for me, 22nd for the rest of the world, um, and there'll be initial an additional data brought in there. Um, but as you can see, whilst there's been a, a small variation in total number of chapters, um, we're sticking at a, at a fairly similar but slightly declining um, number of representatives attending compared to a relatively stable number of representatives listed. Um, and whilst I'm only foreshadowing that as something that I think uh, we all might want to look into further, um, I thought you would be interested uh, in that uh, data as raw as it is. Uh, Laura, if you could uh, flip to the top of the next page. We did sure, a comparison. Sure. Just, just ask a quick of course. question there. Uh, in the percentage Absolutely. chapter reps attending, which is a, a figure uh, a couple of pages down, uh, it looks like yep. that the top line here is something between 40 and 41 percent, and the right. Q3 is something around 28. Is that about right? It is, and that was the um, Asia Pacific friendly time. I see. Um, and we, we we haven't analyzed the effect on the actual chapter representatives coming from what region with relationship to those times yet. I think that'll be a very interesting addition to the analysis. Thank you. Certainly will be. <laughs> um, and, we, of course, we also need to look at um, some external factors. I mean, uh, cause and effect on these things, I'm sure all of you well recognise the amazing things you can do and not do with statistics. Um, but unless we look at some multifactorial analysis on some of this, in other words, what else was happening in the ecosystem that was demanding on the time of our chapter representatives at that time, um, we may not be um, drawing the most uh, stable and uh, accurate conclusions. So we will need to look at some of the um, perhaps not obvious issues, such as were these things in the middle of uh, three major international meetings? I can assure you they were, at least in the last one. Uh, so those are the sort of things that we might need to tease out and hopefully we shall get something useful um, perhaps to guide us where we should be doing things in the future, if nothing else. Um, just to take you into a couple of very, again, superficial comparisons, we admit this, um, we have looked at the number of, of chapters that attended which of the meetings, and this is the beginning of what we hope will be a little bit more detailed analysis on the timing of the meetings, both in the 24-hour UTC clock and in the cadence of what goes on in the internet uh, ecosystem that we've uh, we've managed for the last 12 months. Um, so all we can say is what we've observed, and that is between the first and the second meeting, that was between the March and the May meeting, um, 26, which was our highest number, of chapters uh, attended both of those meetings. Uh, and there was only a one very minor, which was a change in representative um, uh, alteration in the personnel who attended. However, if we look at what happened between the second and the third meeting, in other words, the May and the September meeting, that had jo dropped down to only 17 chapters. And that that is of, certainly for me, um, considerable concern. But what we also note is all the names are the same. So we have a, a clearish indication. Um, sorry about my wibbly wobbly um, statistical speak there, but you know, I can't give you variance because it's not a big enough data set. Um, all the names were the same. That's all we can say. And maybe that is indicating that there is a core group and a um, more variable group of attendees and an analysis on why that happens might also be interesting. 
Um, but relatively close again, uh, coming back up to 23 chapters, attending our first and last meeting, um, we, we really can't see a huge amount of difference here. We have more or back up to more chapters attending, um, but certainly there are a few more new names, but all of them were uh, proxies. So it was a new name because another person was sent um, for an already committed chapter. So there seems to be a, a connected group who are doing as much as they can to engage and a disconnected group, even amongst those that have appointed their representatives. And of course, we also have the joy of those who haven't even appointed the representatives. To tell you who the good guys are, if you look at the bottom of that page, um, 13 chap chapters attended all of the meetings. Um, and it's important to note 10 of them um, which I don't think is insignificant, are not there because they're part of the steering committee. So that gives me some hope. Um, and it also, I think, might be of interest to look at those absolute 100% attendee chapters and those who um, keep a accurate eye on what is going on and those who um, perhaps have a tendency to make um, overreaching or knee-jerk uh, commentary in some of our lists. Um, I suspect that if uh, some people were a, uh, a little more updated by the excellent uh, material we present in these uh, chapter meetings, they might have less concerns, qualms and confusions um, that seem to be plaguing them uh, from time to time. But that also could be me just being a grumpy old woman. Uh, if I can take you to the top one, and it's a pretty little map on the next page, um, we've mapped here the attendance per geographic representation. Whilst that's all very attractive now, I think that will have a great deal more meaning when we dig into some other data points. Um, right now we just notice, yeah, um, Africa and Europe seem to be the leads. Latin America do pretty well. Um, unfortunately, North America, for some unearthly reason, dropped out in the middle of the, the Q2. Um, but under normal circumstances, they're pretty much on par um, with the Middle East, if not a little bit of a head. Um, and Asia Pacific, interestingly enough, um, did better in a time zone which was not purportedly um, the friendliest to them. So um, sometimes uh, uh, we don't know what we don't know and it'll be interesting to find out what that means. Finally, um, the percentage of the chapter reps, um, and that's obviously now a percentage of all possible chapter representatives because there's been a drop in total number of chapters um, as well as a, um, a drop in a couple of um, representatives being listed. But we do note that it is a time of year in this particular quarter where there is a lot of um, uh, renewal of leadership and sometimes that leadership takes a little while to catch up with um, allocation or reallocation of their representatives. So further analysis needs to be done. Um, we would also like to make sure we brought in um, the data from uh, not only the 2022 um, data capture that was done, but we'd like to, um, if time and energy permits, uh, and assuming now I have anything to do with it with the um, the future steering committee, um, we'd like to look at some of the more historical data again. Uh, and the last one, if you can just pop to the final pretty chart, thank you very much, um, simply uh, gives us the thing that we are all very, very much aware of. Um, that's the total number of chapters in the orange column. That is the number of representatives listed for all of those chapters. And unfortunately, we are sticking with around now back up to almost 25% uh, um, or actually one fifth, not 25%. Um, my apologies on that misinterpretation then um, of chapters which have just not appointed. That is a separate issue. It's something we are aware of. And as the, re as the uh, report indicates, something that we would recommend 
will need a personalised touch and outreach to see if we can flip more of those into uh, being appointed. And with that, um, happy reading, but I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the room. Before I get to them, I did want to ask one clarifying question on uh, Comparison D. Uh, you noted that the uh, the three member uh, SC members were um, amongst the 13 chapters that attended all of them. I believe two more are in the most recently appointed set. Is that correct? Assuming that there's that no... Is in, that is indeed correct. Okay, so we definitely are seeing signal there that there is a core group that's um, uh, potentially yes. either already in leadership or intending to become part of the leadership there. Uh, Luis, uh, you had a uh, question? The, just before you that, I, I do want to just give you the flip side of that particular observation, which is absolutely accurate. It also, sadly enough, indicates that there is uh, a considerable number of steering committee members who are not attending all the meetings. Yes. Louise? Here we are. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Well, the uh, thanks for the report, Cheryl. Uh, I see some things that worry me. The decrease of participation, as you have pointed out, but also it is related with some communication issues. And the, the point that brings the uh, a confirmation of this is your last note about translation, right? Uh, there has been this... Um, let's say, a uh, request for a long time about translation. And I know there has been some tries about the AI working in Zoom or whatever, and it still is not satisfactory. So the uh, I still believe, and I want to check with you, if people are still aiming at, um, let's say, conventional translation with someone translating in on a uh, real time, or the uh, because sometimes has been suggested as well that the uh, every document must be translated and it, that takes some time and effort. So that's one point. But uh, so at least on that point, I believe we have an update from Sam. Uh, yes, uh, we've been working on this, uh, and so um, and have been in um, some conversations with Cheryl and other, and I believe Christine is on the call. Um, so we're scoping this out now for 2024, um, but the um, suggestion thus far is to offer English, French, and Spanish interpretation for uh, full chat calls, um, two with human interpretation and two, if possible, with the AI interpretation. We're going to experiment with some tools to see which ones will work best. Um, and also working with the Zoom AI closed captioning tools um, for next year. So. Um, we will um, maintain the working language of the CHAC as English, so written communications, agendas, and so forth will, will be in English. Um, but um, we do want to be responsive to that, to that need to, um, to offer that to the community. So that's the proposal now. Um, Christine is working with, with Cheryl and the CHAC leadership to try to, to bring that about. Um, I think even with some um, moves later this month, right, Cheryl, with one of the the calls in uh, late November um, to, to move forward on this. Thanks. But the, um, well, the thing that, that worries me at the, at the most is what we are seeing communication issues, but thanks to you, to these efforts about uh, translation and interpretation, the, the only thing I get worried is, well, the, uh, we don't want language to be the, a new kind of disability within ISOC, right? Yeah, the, uh, and because people still manage English, but not in a business level. So, so there are places where people effectively get incommunicated because not managing the adequate level of English. But that brings me into the big picture, the big picture, which is communication. And I feel that chapters need to work harder into communication efforts. Uh, one of the things that I noticed in the, in the last months was uh, about the um, listening from this board about the chapter activities. And the uh, I just want to 
talk with you about this issue of board members uh, listening to or participating in the list of the uh, CHAC, not the steering committee about the CHAC. So the uh, it seems to be some sort of misunderstanding about uh, trying to be overwatching the steering committee activities or something like that. But I believe it's only an effort to try to improve communication. But do you uh, can you comment on this, Cheryl? Happy to comment um, and also give a little annotation as well. Um, well, first of all, um, uh, the the full committee list, the full chapter um, advisory council list um, has uh, opened its doors. It's, it was polled and it said, yes, absolutely, you're all welcome. You certainly won't be overtaxed because it is one of the quietest lists. It is not a list that I've ever seen even minor discussion happen on. So happy viewing. Um, you'll be somewhat bored um, because it simply is not the choice of channel. Um, there are, uh, in fact, and this is where the annotation comes in, a number of other and now quite effective, I would argue, uh, communication modalities being used, which is entirely different from when the council was originally formed. If you look at the mechanisms, methodologies and opportunities for communication between org, the board of trustees and our chapters, when we formed as the council and where we are now, it is an entirely different landscape. You have quarterly at least, if not more than quarterly regional um, outreach and engagement activities going on with calls in all of the regions. That wasn't occurring back beforehand. You have a number of uh, regionally appointed, um, uh, regionally seated uh, board of trustee members who also um, interact locally with their regions. You have a number of weekly, in some cases, in the regions, interactions between talented staff and the membership rank and file, not just leadership and representatives. So there is a entirely different communication landscape and we need to be very cautious in my very biased view of thinking, ah, oh, well, it's changed since year dot. Well, of course it has. It's not necessarily a criticism or problem with communication. It might be a product of an entirely different communication and I would argue in some cases more effective communication landscape. Thanks. Okay. And finally, congratulations to the new steering committee that is, uh, was recently announced. Thank you. Are there other comments or questions for Cheryl? Uh, then I think I'd, I'd just like to add my thanks uh, to you both for preparing this uh, very complete report and for the assistance of the steering committee in making sure that the outreach and listening session um, had uh, some opportunities for the board and the chapter advisory council uh, to, to talk together about the upcoming challenges uh, facing us and how we might uh, tackle them together. Thank you very much. Uh, a perfect example, of course, of additional and quality communication was that listening session. Thank you. And if you don't mind, I will take my leave now. I hope you have an excellent couple of days of meetings. But any qualifying questions, pass them through Christine and we'll deal with them. Have Bye for now. And thank you again. Uh, so, uh, Harold, welcome. And uh, it's uh, uh, over to you. Hi right there. Good morning, good afternoon, or whatever. Uh, this is the first time I'm attending uh, this such a meeting, and um, I'm looking forward to meet you more often if possible. So uh, the OMAC uh, activities uh, can be described uh, as uh, three activities that we did over the last uh, couple of months. First was the nomination and election committee volunteers delivered. That meant uh, means that uh, following the requests received from the board to the identify volunteers for the organization members community who would be willing to serve on the respective nomination election committees in 23, 24. Nomination and election cycle, the OMAC officers made the call to organize members volunteers to serve on each committee. 
sharing the chapters and details on the requirements and the time commitment for each. After reviewing the application received, the OMAC offices submitted the information for the two volunteers. So I hope you spell it right. Uh, Barry Macaria for the nomination committee and Melchior Almonds for the election committee. And secondly, we had uh, our round table 15 uh, about fragment, internet fragmentation, a very interesting uh, topic that uh, is um, recognized uh, also in, in the organization members uh, community and uh, con continuing with the goals of creating opportunities for OMAC members to network, learn and have a forum to provide advice to the Internet Society Board and senior management. The OMAC Roundtable 15 was held on 1st of uh, August 23 and the session gave organization members an overview on the progress of ISOC's fragmentation project and introduce the advocacy metrics while identifying involvement opportunities and points of interest for the members. 14 OMAC representatives attended the session and 100% uh, of which rated the session as very good or excellent. Then we had uh, the first meeting in my uh, time that I spent for, uh, with the OMAC uh, to meet with the uh, board of trustees. So uh, the Internet Society Board and the OMAC held a listening session on October 17th. The session was an opportunity for organization members to give their feedback and input to the set of global challenges and strategic goals developed by the board for the Internet Society's 2030 strategy. The input from organization members is to be taken into consideration. Board is um, bought as it further refines the final 2030 strategy in the coming months. 10 OMAG members attended the session. Uh, bringing this uh, to the point, um, we have the feeling that uh, it would be good if we could meet more often with the Board of Trustees. So if we have the feeling that uh, there is a lack of information um, between the OMAC, the OMAC members, and the Board of Trustees. And then I think we could be more successful and, and bring more over to the organization the member if we could have uh, a quarterly meeting. Shouldn't be too long, but just uh, to have a look and get an information on certain topics like organizational structures, uh, content, uh, finance uh, figures, or whatever uh, is of interest. So this is our suggestion uh, to the board, and uh, we're looking forward to get these opportunities. Uh, thank you very much. I, I wanted to go back to your Roundtable 15 internet fragmentation point, and it's it's obviously the case that this is of concern to many different parts of the society. Uh, in addition to the, the work going on in the uh, ISOC fragmentation project, there's also ongoing work in the IEB, and at ITF 117 at the IEB open meeting, uh, there were a number of talks on internet fragmentation uh, that may be of interest uh, to uh, your community if that's that's concerned with this particular matter. Um, Miriya Kulvind or Suresh Krishnan uh, would both be able to uh, provide uh, copies of those talks because they're um, they're uh, submitted uh, with video, uh, so they're all available through that. Um, Thank you again for the organization members' input to the Internet Society's five-year strategy. I think it was a, a good a good session, um, and uh, we're we're certainly uh, anxious to consider it. Um, I did want to ask one question for you on your advice to the uh, Internet Society board and leadership. Obviously, we do have quarterly meetings as a board, uh, and those are open meetings. Um, uh, do you do you have the the impression that we have potentially not advertised the existence of those meetings and that there are sections of those meetings which are open meetings adequately to OMAC? And how would we do that if, if you feel we, we have not? I think it's all about uh, communications. And, and there are a lot of things that we don't know, no? um, but uh, would like to be involved. And I think uh, it would be good if, if we could get this um, more organized. Um, Please. Yeah, just a quick congratulation to the OMAC because on the last exercise of uh, 
survey about the uh, where uh, 2030 uh, plans, the uh, I saw an overwhelming participation of OPMAC members. So I think uh, it's a lot because of the coordination of the uh, of the, the, the uh, OMAC and, your, and yourself, Harold. So the uh, I encourage you to keep it on on that way, and of course the. Uh, I agree on your communication views of the, the points related to participation. Thanks. Yeah. So I, I will tell you that I have gotten a number of uh, communications, some some with uh, positive and some with decidedly negative um, uh, discussions of the decision uh, to uh, graduate Manners to a new organization and to give it um, a um, a new home. And I, I, I do want to stress to you that there were aspects of that which we would have liked to have shared more broadly, but because they were both uh, financial decisions that, that reflected um, concerns about our, our ongoing issues with public support test and most especially negotiations with other bodies, where the amount of discussion we could realistically have had um, has been um, necessarily limited by those circumstances. What we can definitely do, and we're certainly more than happy to do, is at the quarterly meetings, uh, help you understand the context in which some of these decisions are being made. Uh, for example, it, it is the case that the, the primary reason we wanted to make sure that we could graduate Manners is by moving it into an organization uh, with an aligned purpose, we were uh, at that point, able to guarantee its funding for a number of years in the future by funding it through the foundation. And that, in turn, makes sure that Manners, as a project and an ongoing effort to, to assist the internet uh, with its security in, in the routing space, uh, was given a better guarantee than keeping it within ISOC itself would have been. And that kind of context, we can help you understand, you know, when it is that actually having a project in an aligned organization gives us a little bit uh, greater freedom of movement, uh, we can give you the context. That's no question, and we'd be happy to. Um, but some of the individual decisions, like the timing or the organizational discussions that led up to that particular organization taking on um, manners as, as its new home, uh, those are unfortunately things that we, we likely would not be able to share with you at these quarterly meetings. Uh, so I, I, I do just want to be clear that we'll, we'll share with, with you um, as much as we can, but there will continue to be some things where um, only the context will be obvious to you until the decision is reached. Okay, thank you very much. That sounds like a plan, huh? Okay, uh, I just wanted to check to see if Funke or Charles had comments because it's a little bit hard for me to check in with you visually. Um, uh, Charles, did you have any questions or comments? Uh, I, I I have also actually heard some comments, feedback about manners, but uh, like Ted said, maybe it's very difficult or impossible for us to share or to consult before beforehand. But uh, having having happened, I think I agree that uh, going forward we should uh, try to explain uh, about this. Uh, decision as much as possible and try to address all the uh, concerns from the community because there were some, but uh, I am not able to, te to tell myself how, how, how serious it is, but there had been some uh, that I heard. So uh, yeah, we, I, I think I saw as an organization has to do something about it. Yeah. Even though uh, we were not able to consult beforehand. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charles Funkate. Were there any comments you had? Morning, everyone. No, no comments from me for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Funky, just so you know, uh, I, I understand your video is, is not on at the moment. Uh, if you do raise your hand in the, in the tool, we will be able to see that because Lauren, Lauren is monitoring that. Are there any, other, any other comments or Thank questions? Thank you. Right? Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions from those in the room? Okay, well, um, 
the, the next step, it sounds like we should do is advertise a bit better when the, the quarterly uh, open uh, board meetings are uh, to make sure that the OMAC and uh, the Chack Steering Committee are informed of those and understand which parts of them will be open. And uh, obviously, that gives an opportunity uh, for some uh, natural interaction, and we can see if that uh, meets the need or we need to schedule something in addition once we've tested that. Uh, thank you very much for your report, Harold, and uh, you. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, and good luck for the day. Thank you. Ted, yeah, actually, I think that in the parking lot, we should discuss about the um, this opportunity to, to to have more organized meetings with the uh, uh, chapters, organization members, and IETF in order to have a better interaction with them. Yeah, I would like to discuss that if okay. possible. Uh, Lauren, could you make a note for the uh, parking? Uh, so that will be added to the the um, the agenda in the parking lot. Um, there are a couple more reports which were received um, as written reports only. There are a few things in them I wanted to draw your attention to, uh, and then we can discuss uh, any other issues which came up. Uh, one from uh, Lars Eggert um, was the, the basic report from the ITF chair or IESG chair. And the one thing I wanted to call your attention to is that the, the structure of the work in the ITF is changing uh, to some extent as they are reorganizing the areas and the transport area, which had formerly been uh, an independent area, largely focused on congestion control and similar issues, um, has been folded into a, a new area, uh, web and internet transport. And that's because much of the transport work at this point involves uh, QUIC, uh, which is the substrate for HTTP3, and it was uh, seen as a natural uh, evolution there. Uh, the uh, art area will continue um, uh, containing a, a smaller number of um, working groups focused on real-time communications, things like MUser or AVT Core, uh, and the traditional uh, email and messaging standards. So uh, that reorganization is going on. If you have questions about it, there's more in the report. Um, I also wanted to uh, call your attention uh, to the IEB report. Uh, uh, on the topic of both of fragmentation uh, and sustainability. Uh, one of the challenges that we identified when we were going through in our retreat as global challenges uh, was the impact of China, climate change and the, the need for attention to uh, how the, the internet response will impact uh, climate change. And the e-impact work that has started in the IEB and some related work in the ITF is starting to tackle sustainability questions, uh, hopefully from a full life cycle perspective, um, as it relates to the internet technology stack. Uh, so there's uh, more about that in Miria's report and pointers to the impact report as well. Uh, I also wanted to invite uh, Victor, uh, do you want to speak at all uh, to the trust report or to the current transition in uh, the trust from being uh, an individual set of trustees to being an LLC? Sure, I can speak briefly to it. Um, so for those who have had an opportunity to look at the report, there haven't, uh, most of the action over the last short while has been managing the transition. I mean, the Delaware Corporation is in place at this point. Um, there's been a lot of recent work um, just to kind of close down some of the initial set of bylaws. There is a note in the report that um, might probably the one thing to talk about is this, this a lot of discussion around how to create the right transparency for the trust. I think a lot of bodies have traditionally mentioned that we don't know what happens there. It's kind of mis mysterious to the rest of the organization. So um, one of the conversations over the last while has been, well, now these, these trustees are also directors of the corporation and they can just amend the bylaws whenever they feel like it. How will, it, you know, how will people react to that? So we've added some additional time, like a 60 day notice period. So if there were to be any changes to the bylaws, that there would be sufficient opportunity for the, for the, um, you know, various other bodies to see what those amended uh, bylaws would look like, be able to create the right uh, um, timelines for folks to comment on it or provide feedback. 
So there's been a lot of sensitivity around that. In terms of the mechanics of the actual transition, that you know the lawyers have been helping quite well. They get paid quite well to do so, um, and so uh, that's kind of going over. Uh, you know, pseudo uneventful. There's not there hasn't been too much um, action there other than you know going through it. You know, with a fine tooth comb. So that's it's kind of like the high level. Um, there hadn't been any licensing requests in the last period. So the actual workflow. Like the thing that the trust would normally do outside of creating a corporation and moving assets over has not been very heavy over the last couple of months. That's the short version. Uh, thank you very much. I, I will say I, I saw the very first of those 60-day consultations, which obviously is not yet required. Um, but the, the consultation about the consultation was a very nice uh, thing to see as a demonstration of the intent uh, to have this be as transparent as possible. Uh, the other thing I'll call the uh, board's attention to is the, the mechanism by which the IETF advises the trust of what it wants to do is by publishing an RFC, um, uh, the most recent of which uh, has the, the set of advice. But there is a proposal which came to the Gen Dispatch Working Group uh, at IETF 118 for a very significant change to the advice, uh, which would uh, change the policy of the trust to encourage uh, the granting of derivative works. Uh, I spoke at that, and so I'm not a neutral um, party uh, on, on that, but I, I would think it's probably fair to say that it did not receive the consent of the room and that ongoing discussion on what um, other possible proposals might change the advice of the board, uh, sorry, to the trust, uh, is still ongoing. Yeah. Um Glad you brought that up. I had purposely not mentioned it, but actually it's probably fair to have talked to that since it's so new and it just happened this week and we haven't really digested all of the feedback yet and waiting for the mailing list to fire up. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, I think the way you've meant, the way you've spoke to it is, is perfectly accurate. I, I, I don't know if as a body, as we talked about it, I don't know if we fully grasp the, the full meaning of what this would entail for us. So, um, that was quite a, it's going to be a fruitful discussion, I guess, that will happen over the next short while, or maybe not. I don't know if it's going to die or it's going to continue. Let's see how it goes. Luis? Yeah, regarding the IETF, the, um, also it brings into the point that I want to discuss later on the parking lot. But the, um, I'm, I, want, I don't want to use the word worrying. But the uh, at the end is something like that. But the, I just figure out how many people in the IETF are still thinking that uh, IETF is completely different and separated from ISOC, right? The uh, how people on the IETF uh, sometimes believe that ISOC is something that is under the, uh, the under IETF. No, not even the same level, but under, yes, which is a, a sort of uh, ISOC should respond to a IETF thinking, yes. And really, I, I, I'm not sure how we should respond to that or even if we should respond to that. But, the, uh, but uh, somehow that community is not understanding at all the, uh, the way the full ecosystem is working, right? John? Is this thing on? Says on. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously there is a greater need for coordination. And th this is something that, you know, we have um, traditionally, I think the, the best point of coordination has been the liaison between the Internet Society and uh, the IEB, right? Which you can see kind of the IEB is setting a lot of the overall architectural and policy direction. And so the places, since, since most of ISOC's concerns, I guess, Lay, lay closer to that policy realm. Um, and I, I understand there's, there's been a recent change in uh, who is actually going to be representing uh, that liaison from our side to the IB, which is a, a, good, a good change, right? But the <laughs> Siri apparently had some input on this as well. Uh, that happened at 9.47 a.m., the, uh, the transition did. But, 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 you know, I mean, you know, going back more broadly, and we've discussed this, I think, um, you know, very candidly, I think, in some of these rooms in the past, you know, there, there has occasionally been some misalignment, right, between what 
IETF consensus turns out to be and maybe what uh, the directions of some programs that ISOC has decided to fund have been. And, you know, the remedy to that, I think, is, again, just stronger coordination. I, I, I certainly don't think anybody, people at the ITF don't even care about ISOC enough to consider whether it's above or below them would be the way I'd characterize this, right? These are kids who show up there and are worried about bits on the wire. And like, this is, you know, the kinds of things that we're concerned with this room are so ancillary to that, it, aside from just this relatively small set of things. This is at least my perception of the situation. So but I, that may be worst, right? If people even don't care. Well, well but, but why would they? I mean, again, this, the ITF consensus is something that surrounds, you know, should we have four bytes for this field or five bytes for this field, right? And that's the things that people get passionate mm -hmm. about and that get argued at great length at the microphone. And like, it's simply orthogonal to the vast majority of the things that we're concerned about here at, at at the ISOC board, at least, and I think more broadly, even in the, the chapters and, and your group. So, Brian. Yeah, and Luis, I'm going to echo what John said and actually point out that he and I live in different parts of the IETF. The farther down the stack you go, the less they care about ISOC because they really are only worried about what does the format of this field look like? Yes, that's it. And, and that's, that's fine. They can do that. I, I think the average IETF person might know that ISOC provides some funding for the IETF, and that's probably it. Well, once I was surprised was from someone thinking otherwise that IETF was funding ISOC, uh, which could be completely nonsense. Well, I, I, I think we all have to acknowledge that both historically and even up to the present day, there's a sense in which some of the funding that comes to ISOC comes from organizations that have been backers of the ITF and they view <coughs> supporting ISOC as the, you know, the corporate structure behind the ITF. You know, that that that's kind of their motivation, right, to, to be in on this. And so, you know, I mean, they're, they're, like many things, I think it's more complicated, right? Um, I think you can make the argument both ways about that. <coughs> so At the Funke, end, my, uh, sorry, Funke has an intervention. Uh, I saw that you typed something and you have your hand up. Unfortunately, I, it, it's too small for me to read at this distance. So if you can uh, read out what you typed as well when you when you get that, Funke. Uh, sure, I, I didn't want to interrupt, but I just wanted to ask, uh, what's the implication of that diminishing awareness or... Uh, I don't want to say importance of ISOC as you go around, down the wrong or across some of these groups. Is that does that have any implication for uh, the foundation and for our ISOC itself in the long term, or what's responsible for for that? I'm just curious to know why, you know, the language around people not really caring about ISOC. Thank you. Uh Thank you. I, I can probably answer that by saying it's not that they don't care about ISOC. Those that know about ISOC um, in any detail do care about it. And there have been a series uh, of different relationships that um, ISOC has had to the ITF over time. So historically, um, the ITF was more or less a collective delusion. It had no formal... <laughs> Uh, existence whatsoever. It was supported by organizations which did have a formal existence. The uh, ISC, which hosted the RFC editor, had a formal uh, thing. The Secretariat, which was based at CNRI, had a formal um, uh, existence. But the ITF as a, as a set of working groups was uh, an informal association. Um, that transition occurred when the first of the IASA programs went through and the ITF became an organized activity of ISOC. And there was a single uh, executive director under the Internet Society who was a paid staff member. And all of the rest of the work of <clears throat> the IETF in supporting functions was managed through contracts. So he basically <coughs> worked with uh, uh, the association management team uh, to do that, um, but it was just, just one single employee of, of ISOC who was responsible for that. And over time, it was identified as potentially a, a choke point for the growth of uh, the ITF, and it became <coughs> um, 
a subsidiary organization as a single member LLC under ISOC at that point. Now, there was a consideration at that point of whether or not it should become an independent organization aligned with ISOC. Um, and uh, uh, John and Jason Livingood, who's currently chair of the ITL LLC, uh, were the working group chairs of that IASA 2 effort. And the, the very strong uh, consensus of the ITF was no, they wanted to remain part of ISOC um, and keep the structure of the single member LLC. But it sort of pop, bubbles up into the um, consciousness of ISOC, or sorry, the ITF, uh, in situations like that where there's a proposal for change. And then it goes back into kind of the substrate knowledge of, uh, oh, yes, among the uh, ways the ITF is funded is uh, a strong amount of money and a long-term commitment from <laughs> ISOC. Um, but the, in the day-to-day -day work of the IETF, uh, ISOC very deliberately has no role in managing the standards direction or process. Uh, there's a separation of concerns there. The IESG manages the, the standards process, and the only role ISOC has is this board is the last stop in an appeals chain. If somebody argues that the processes uh, for appeal or the processes for the management of the standards process are inadequate, um, but we would never at this level make a decision about any standard outcome. Um, and so we're, um, uh, in some sense, <clears throat> excuse me, a structural part of the IETF in the same way that they are legally a part of us. Uh, it, it's, a, it's complicated, as the old status in uh, people's dating apps used to say. Um, I hope that helped. And, oh, oh, sorry, Barry, go ahead. So just a adding to that, the, um, the funding issues was in the old days, um, ISOC did all the fundraising um, for the IETF, and contributions to the IETF were actually contributions to ISOC, and that's how it happened. Uh, there is now um, an IETF endowment where people can make contributions directly to the IETF, and the IETF has its own, the IETF LLC has its own fundraising staff. But still, contributions to the IETF endowment are effectively contributions to ISOC still in the accounting stuff. Yeah, so, we share 1990. So right. from the point of view of the, the, the tax authorities, we are still a single organization. Yes. Um, but there is more than one value proposition, and from a fundraising perspective, by doing this separation, you can fundraise on the value proposition of the ITF's work, or you can fundraise on the proposition of the larger ISOC. And, so and, I, and I also add that, that the um, a few years ago, we made it much easier for people to contribute when they registered for the IETF meeting. There's a add a contribution here, and we've been getting uh, on the order of five or six thousand dollars a meeting through those contributions in addition to all the uh, sponsorship and hosting money. That's uh, Laura and then Elise. I was just noting that uh, Harold had a comment, which I can read from here if you'd like. Uh, my impression is that IETF is rather understood to be an organization of ICANN rather than ISOC. No, that would be wrong. <laughs> Luis. Yeah, just a clarification. It was not a complaint. It's just pointing out that something that is on the, on the move. But the, uh, the real concern, I think, it should be community. We are talking about that our biggest asset as ISOC is the community. And the community is diverse. As you say, there, there is some part that used to be dysfunctional and was under... The, 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 the whole community, and it was embraced in, in, in some way. These guys only worried about bits and bytes and wires and nuts, uh, really are part of our community. And the, uh, also the guys connecting other guys in the far regions of Africa are also our community. And guys in the OMAC thinking about the big, big business on the internet is also the community. I think as a board, we should embrace that mission to bring that community in a, a, a more co co cohesive. Yes, there's more cohesion in our community. And, and go back into the 
origins of uh, ISOC, uh, which are in their corporation, that, that talk about this community and the way ISOC is embracing the development of their community. Thanks. Uh, thank you. And I certainly think the board as a whole agrees that uh, finding ways to increase the communication among the different parts of the community and the cohesion of the group and supporting the mission as a whole is necessary. Uh, any other interventions on this topic? Okay, uh, we have one more housekeeping thing to do uh, before we uh, take a short break and return to as the foundation board. And that is the approval of the minutes of the 175th ISOC board meeting. Uh, the proposed resolution is before you and it basically says, whereas the ISOC board of trustees has reviewed the minutes of the 175th board meeting. Attached here to is exhibit A, resolved that the minutes of the 175th <laughs> meeting of the ISAC Board of Trustees are approved. Is there any uh, discussion or are there any questions about the proposed resolution? Uh, seeing none, may I ask all those in favor uh, to please raise their hand. Any opposed? Any abstain? Uh, seeing none, uh, we uh, will call that approved. Thank you very much. And so we will now take a break in the ISOC Board of Trustees meeting. Um, uh, when we return, we will actually um, uh, convene as the Internet Society Foundation Board, um, and then we'll return to the ISOC Board meeting uh, later in the weekend. Um, so, um, We'll take a short break now. Please take uh, 10 minutes or so and we'll be back then. Welcome everybody. Um, we are returning to the Internet Society board meeting number 176 here on the 11th of November in Prague. The next item of business is the president and CEO's report um, from Andrew Sullivan. <laughs> uh, so this will be pretty short because um, uh, the important things are uh, in what Sally's going to discuss, but, um, uh, you know, we've got a few things that uh, have been hanging on, uh, so I thought I would bring you up to date. Um, as you are aware, since um, uh, since we met um, at the last meeting, the Internet Society um, had to reduce the size of its staff, so we had a reduction, um, and this uh, you know, was obviously painful, difficult for um, everybody involved. Uh, but I think it has put us on a better footing uh, for next year. Uh, we have, um, and, and we will be able to see the results of that in today's um, or this meeting's um, uh, discussion about um, uh, the budget for next year and so forth. We have managed to open some room uh, in order to, um, you know, fulfill the, um, the duties that the, the Internet Society uh, has. I, uh, I, I, I would be, it, it would be wrong of me not to talk a little bit about um, uh, the, the effects that this had on staff morale. Um, and it's been interesting to watch. Um, we, we haven't completed our, um, our regular staff survey yet, uh, but um, uh, there have been, you know, there, there were some people who are very negatively affected and so on. But there were also some remarks from some people about, um, you know, understanding. Uh, I think that this is the first time that the Internet Society has had to do this. And I think it um, caused certain people to sit up and say, oh, um, you know, they've been talking about this. They mean it. Uh, so sometimes that's a necessary thing that you have to go through in, in an organization's life. And I think it has it has had some, um, you know, positive consequences as well. Um, we did have a new uh, head of HR start, um, and um, so that what this means, of course, is that I only have three jobs right now, um, and that's an improvement in my life, I will tell you, uh, but I'm very enthusiastic about that. Um, when we uh, meet uh, in uh, a place that isn't quite so far away, probably um, Erica will come and join us so you can meet her in person, um, but I, I thought it was unfair um, to ask somebody to fly all this way. Um, just to say hello to everyone, um, particularly given our um, our own financial circumstances. 
Uh, I don't have much more to, t um, uh, to say about this, except that Sally is going to um, be presenting some things about, um, uh, about progress, but I'm happy to take any questions that anybody might have. Oh, Luis. Sorry. The, uh, are you an honorary Canadian now? <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> and, you know, we we start our, our things with sorry, but I didn't I didn't know it. I didn't know it. Well, we did that in Spanish. Oh, well. Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> so the uh, last year, if we remember, we were talking about disabilities, and the uh, in that resolution, it asks you to report on the progress of that. So we have any advancement in that work? I think what it asked was that I needed to produce a policy and I have not produced a policy yet. Um, I, I need to produce a, a draft that is to be adopted by, uh, by the board. I hope to get to it before the end of the year. I have some very useful and very helpful input from, um, from the standing group, uh, but um, the number of duties that have fallen to me this year have sort of consumed all of, all of the time that I have. Um, we don't have anybody else to do this right now. Um, the um, everybody who could work on it is busy working on other things. In particular, the um, uh, oh, that was one thing that I should have mentioned. I guess the the replacement of member Nova um, has turned out to be rather bumpier than we'd hoped, and that has consumed essentially the entire systems group um, uh, over the course of, of most of the year. So, whereas normally I probably would have delegated it to them. I, I mean, I, they just don't have the cycles either. Uh, it does appear that we're going to get the the um, uh, Fontiva system up and running in December. So um, you know that will that that will be better. Um, but of course, that doesn't that doesn't meet the goal of getting the um, uh, getting a, a draft policy before the end of the year. So it will have to fall to me. Well, and now that you mentioned the. Is that Fontiva thing is going to be solved anytime? Or well, I mean, we have a date now, so um, and I think it's a real date. It's in December. Yeah, we can we can put all our bets into that. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, if I had the kind of um, if I had the kind of crystal ball that allowed me to predict with perfect accuracy the future, then probably I would have a different job. Um, uh, like you know. I don't know, lying in a hammock, but um, uh, but it, in I, I am I am cautiously optimistic about this date. We have had uh, uh, we've we've had a number of rounds uh, of data changes and so forth that seem to be working, although nothing has been perfect yet. Uh, so we have not had a complete end to end um, uh, success. Um, but um, I, the uh, the errors so far have been identified correctly. We know what they are. Um, you know, we seem to have uh, seem to have adapted to them. Uh, they adjusted the schedule somewhat in order to accommodate some of the things that they learned. I, I I think the team has has a path forward that is a, is a real one. There is adequate testing involved in it this time, which is better than I can say for the previous plan, which I discovered late had left out a bunch of tests that I thought were important. So, um, you know, we we do have uh, we do have a path forward, but uh, you know. There is always a risk that you discover something at the last minute. Um, it's very, very important that we complete this within this year because um, there are a number of ancillary systems with our existing thing that are only priced annually. So if we do not make this date this year, uh, our budget for next year is in big trouble. Yeah, because the um, well, we have been in that process for. Two years, two it, years and a half. It has taken a long time. I, I part of the challenge is that um, the system that we are migrating from is um, it, it is not a traditional data system um, for reasons that are lost to the mists of time. Um, we selected a system in Member Nova that, in my opinion the application is a sort of classic use of a relational data system. Mm -hmm. And they decided that they would implement it as a NoSQL system um, with like full blown JSON um, goodness. Um, and good is perhaps in scare quotes there. Um, and the result of this is that building the, the uh, is that migrating the data out essentially requires 
completely rebuilding the data model, and and that has taken a lot of time. Yeah. Well, the um, but back into the disabilities and what do we need to allocate if needed to get the uh, what we resolved that should be implemented in in short time because we were uh, in that time we were talking about six months i don't uh, believe you said that i had to implement anything i think what you told me i had to do was provide you with a draft um and that is what i'm going to do yeah but the uh, uh, as far as i remember from that resolution uh, uh, it was supposed that in six months uh, something should be implemented. I, I did not have a, day, a, a deadline in the, in, in the resolution. If I'd had a deadline, I would have made sure I met it. Okay. So the report is there is no advancement. I, I, I have not advanced on it. That's right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, um, so I'm here to present the uh, Internet Society Q3 update. Uh, because this is the last um, update of the year to the board, this will cover um, into a bit of Q4 as well. Um, there is a longer uh, set of slides that I have um, submitted into Board Effect that gives you a project by project um, success measure update. I'm not going to do that um, project by project here. Um, I'm going to try to hit the highlights. Uh, the approach I usually use for these is to try to show you um, impacts that have happened in the quarter, or in this case, Q3 and Q4, um, that are the result of sort of multi-quarter or possibly even multi-year efforts. Um, and if that is something the board continues to be interested in, that's feedback that, that would be welcome. Um, Andrew mentioned that, of course, in Q3, we went through the, the staff reduction, um, and I'll speak a little bit to the impact of that on um, the achievement of the action plan when we get to the, to the end of the slide deck. Um, I actually put a few too many slides in here, given the time, so I'm going to race through a few things, but if you want to, to focus on any of them, just let me know. Uh, so next slide. So as you know, we um, divide our work into um, two different areas, uh, growing the internet and um, strengthening the internet. So I'm going to speak first to um, the work we're doing to build the internet um, across the globe. Next slide. So in 2022, we signed an MOU with USAID uh, to provide um, technical training advice for community networks um, to support the, the work that they were doing on connectivity across the Philippines. Um, and coming into this year in 2023, Q3, um, three of those community networks were successfully launched, which brought 600 um, households online um, in, in the Philippines um, across those islands. So this was a good partnership um, with USAID. It was not a funding partnership, but it was a, a recognition of the, of the work and the approach that, that we take. On measuring the internet, I think you're all aware that in Q3, we launched the Internet Resilience Index, the IRI, and the Pulse Country Reports. Um, this is part of our ongoing effort to take the various data streams that are coming into Pulse and present them into um, reports and, um, and information sets that are useful to our audience, uh, policymakers, community, um, media, et cetera. And you'll, of course, every time you, you re we release one of these, we, we see increased uh, media attention. Um, and the good news is at the end of Q3, we um, uh, achieved our or exceeded our 2023 goal for media attention um, to Pulse this year. Um, I would also say that when I was in Kyoto and the meetings that I had with partners in um, governments, this tool is really attractive to them. They're really interested in the insights that are coming out of that. And it's actually really nice to be able to point to, to this, whether it's on shutdowns or connectivity, resilience, et cetera. I, I just wanted to add that I've had several meetings with uh, policymakers in especially European context who, who have cited it as one of the most valuable tools uh, that they've seen in, a, in this particular area. Sure. Ah, thanks for mentioning that. Is anybody mad about it? Not yet that we heard it. Just curious. <laughs> oh, oh, please tell. We, we do get occasional um, nasty grams from people um, who are called out as shutting down the internet. Yes, Good. Those, those people yes. are bad. <laughs> I was actually starting to think the, of that. The, the, the government that. of India in particular has, I have received some rather nasty remarks about how Kashmir is not in fact shut down. And, you know, 
we can't send any traffic in or out. So uh, our, our definition is bad. Um, on sustainable peering infrastructure, um, as you know, we, we shifted our um, support for IXPs, um, the, the direct, oh, it's, no, okay. Luis's mic is on, is he? Oh, I thought you had a question, okay. Um, so early, or as a result of the reallocation last year, we shifted our, our funding for um, IXPs uh, to the foundation. And so the first part of the year was about um, building out that grant program. And in Q3, we now have a very strong pipeline of both grant applications and awards as a result of that reallocation. So that was a lot of work. Sarah pointed to that earlier in terms of the collaboration. It takes a long time to get that up and going and get the community ready to accept um, the new approach. And so we're, we're happy to see that going through now. Uh, we also held uh, the African Peering and Interconnection Forum, AFPIF, in August in Ghana. It was a very successful event, um, and um, we're really quite proud of that. And I, there are some subsequent slides about um, the IXP work. If people want to go into that a bit, we can. But um, this event continues to show the, um, the relevance of that uh, work to support the peering ecosystem in Africa and the value that the, the communities, the operator communities, the ASNs, et cetera, um, find um, in that particular event. Um, oh, I see Charles, looks like he has his hand up. Yes, just a very quick question about the, uh, the update about the, uh, uh, the MOU about uh, the development in the Philippines. Uh, I wonder, number one, uh, is, is that announced yet or there will be there will be some some announcement about it? Second, uh, like for example, our chapter in the Philippines, are they involved in any ways or have the knowledge about it? Because I think it will really help them to, to get the profile of the ISOP out uh, in their region. Thank you. Yeah, sure, Charles. Um, absolutely. The chapter has been very involved in this. Um, and part of what we have been trying to do is involve them in the actual training and capacity building work um, that's been done. So, um, yeah, it was announced and it was um, done in very close collaboration. We have a very good chapter in the Philippines, of course. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that was a good a good point of collaboration. Great. Thank you. Uh -huh. yep. Just a quick there. When you talk about polls, the, uh, I think it was very positive the way community received the information from polls because it has launched a lot of discussions about the, uh, how it's going. So I will encourage people to continue participating and also the, uh, the way the, um, it was reviewed in, by regions, it, it's very important because that way People are not comparing in a sense of a challenge. They are just comparing it. What else can we do? Yes. So that I feel those sort of uh, initiatives are bringing uh, the good discussion into community. Thanks. That's good. It's really nice to hear the feedback. I will um, bring that back to the team for sure. Um, there will be an opportunity, as you'll see in Action Plan 24, we're trying to improve the user interface of Pulse. And so getting the kind of community feedback after having worked with the tool for a while, I think will be really important because that's gonna be a big focus for next year. Um, but thank you for that. Um, lastly, uh, we have um, long had a partnership with um, AFIX. Um, that is a um, community of internet exchange points in Africa that we have long been supportive of. This is our model, right? We want um, local community um, development of the internet. And part of that is by sharing experiences um, and information across um, providers, in this case, IXPs. And Internet Society has been a long supporter of AFIX. Um, they held their first annual general meeting um, uh, this quarter. Um, with ISOC support. This is really important because the next step um, for us is to begin the transition of AFPIF to AFIX um, by the end of 2025. And we're working through that over the next several years. To us, this is another example of um, ISOC incubating something and then um, being able to turn it to a community partner that's ready to accept it. That does not mean that we stop supporting AFPIF. Of course, we would be um, very strong supporters of it, as we always have. But it would be increasingly community-run and community-developed, which is important. 
Charles again. Yes, about the post report, uh, uh, I, I, I guess to the uh, to the layman, uh, non technical people out there, the last few weeks there has been probably more knowledge about this particular terms about internet shutdowns and so on than ever before. So I'm just wondering whether or not we have noticed any particular new interest or mentions by the media of our report, uh, of, of the post report uh, uh, at all over this period. Well, it, it is con a controversial period this time, at this time and, and the shutdown in the Gaza, but, uh, but I'm just wondering whether or not we have been uh, noticing any any additional traffic or or mentions uh, recently. Thank you. I do believe that um, uh, some of the data has been cited. I would have to get the specific mentions for you, Charles, which I can do. Um, but yes, I mean the the topic of of shutdowns and uh, particularly in light of the geopolitical events has been front page reading um, for many people. So. Um, I'll I'll get some specific reports for you if that's of of interest. Well, I just don't want to take up too much of your time. Just curious about this, mm -hmm. but thank you. Okay. Next slide. Um, I I guess I will fast forward through these pretty quickly um, unless people want to go into this. But what I was trying to do here, and I, I'm going to go quickly in the interest of time, but the Internet Society has been in um, the, the peering ecosystem uh, environment for a long time. We've had a long commitment to the development of Internet exchange points as a methodology for increasing um, resiliency of the Internet, uh, particularly in developing countries um, in regions like Africa. Um, but not just Africa, of course. Um, and we're starting to really see some of the benefits of that work. Um, it's not just ISOC, of course, um, but really trying to, to work through um, technical deployments, community building, um, partnerships, training, um, a lot of different pieces that come together to really um, start to demonstrate uh, the impact of this um, and fundamentally on people's lives, right? The internet is uh, more reliable, more affordable across the region um, because of the infrastructure that we contribute to, then we see the benefits for, for humanity that, that we care about. Um, I was struck by this this time because these are some of these are slides that Michuki, um, our distinguished expert for this work, um, presented at AFPIF, and there's some really good insights here where we start to see um, the robustness of the network um, across Africa. Oh yeah. So it's 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 more of a comment um, and um, observation. Um, so. These are good stories that uh, come out from ISOC, which I feel that we need to really tell our story. Um, one clear example of the support ISOC gave to the Nigerian Parent Forum, um, which was held like um, two weeks or some few weeks ago, is that it, it brought most of the operators together and some MOUs were signed, even at the meeting there. Take, for example, I'm aware that layer three and Internet Exchange Point, Nigerian Internet Exchange Point, um, signed some MOUs and even Netflix decided to put their cash servers um, with the Nigerian Internet Exchange Point and layer three. So these are some good stories that I know that ISOC supports and that we should celebrate and we should keep pushing out that story so that people will see some of the impact of what we've done. So um, I would say congratulations on this, but we still need to tell our story. Like they say, um, if um, the lion fails to tell his own story, the hunter will probably give himself, crown himself that he's the king of the forest, right? So. Uh, That's fair. Um, we actually just launched just, I think it was, I saw it in Slack the other day, um, the, the impact, um, landing page where we're trying to really get better about talking about this very thing, you know, the work that we do here and how does that impact over time? Because we agree with you. Um, we need to get better about telling these stories. But I think your point, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to mention this with respect to AFPIF and these other peering forums is, I think as many of you in the infrastructure space know, the bilateral conversations are critical in this space. 
And if you don't have a forum for those to happen, then um, that has a lot of effects. So that's part of what the Internet Society is trying to support through these kinds of forums. So um, AFPIF is the the global or the regional one, but then there are the the sub regional ones as well that are really effective. All right. Oh, did oh I'm sorry, Luis. Do we have some information? Uh, we're focusing on AXP, yes, in Africa. Do we have some information about other areas? Uh, I'm just wondering about what's, what's happening in the Middle East. If there is a IXP or the uh, still there is no IXP uh, uh, sponsored by ISOC. There's interest. Um, and but the policy and regulatory environment has to support it, um, so it's a bit more challenging. Um, but there is interest, and there are conversations that are happening in the Middle East. And I'm showing this for Africa, and I. But we could do a similar presentation in other regions. Um, I, this one is just hanging off the fact that we had AFPIF in in Q3 of this year. Um, all right. Oh, was Victor? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to, it's a bit of a repetition. I was going to say almost the same thing. And then Lewis mentioned, so I just want to double down. Like if there is an opportunity, I know it's a lot, but, um, you know, the next region where, you know, I, there are challenges in peering today is probably the Middle East where you could use some love if possible. Yeah, we agree. All right. So we'll just race through these others real quickly, Lauren. This is actually um, some of Machuki's slides out of telegeography. You can see the intra-African routes from 2016. If we keep going, 2019, 21, and 23. It's pretty cool, huh? Um, when he showed that to me, I was like, oh, I put that in there. Um, so, and speaking to this, this is this is um, the attendance at AFPIF, and you'll see this in the 24 report, because we don't want to hold meetings just to hold them, right? Um, and having 900 people in the room, if they're not the right people, also isn't particularly interesting. So understanding who is showing up, who's finding value in these events is something that we want to keep measuring. Um, and, and so one thing that Machuki points out here is that there, there's been a significant rise in data center um, operator participation at AFPIF which is, is interesting. They're finding value in that. That's a community that wasn't present at AFPIF, let's say, two years ago. Um, and so he's really you know, quite pleased with that. And it's, I think, showing the continued evolution of the environment in that region. Next slide. All right, so our work on strengthening the internet. Um, in routing security, um, we um, continue to get a lot of interest by policymakers in uh, manners and in routing security generally. Um, we want to ensure that, that the governments who are interested in this really do focus on the community-led approach, uh, the norms approach that we've developed and not um, a more heavy-handed regulatory um, approach to this. And we've been pleased um, with the engagement in this case with the U.S. government on this. Um, where they've been really quite welcoming of, of the Manners Initiative and trying to point to it. Of course, as this board is aware, we also reached agreement about the transition of the Secretariat for Manners to the Global Cyber Alliance, um, and really think that this puts uh, Manners on a really nice, sustainable footing going forward. Um, with respect to fragmentation, um, this was a new project this year. Um, we had a nice little success at the IETF in San Francisco um, in the Policymaker Program. Uh, the Canadian Department of Heritage uh, participated in that program and then has reached out to us about doing an internet impact assessment workshop as they start the development of the online harms bill. So this is a really nice opportunity to see that impact assessment work done at the outset of legislation um, and a willingness by these policymakers to engage with us on that. So that was that was encouraging. The environment in Canada is tricky and we'll see where it goes, but um, you know, the door is open and, and that's that's really good. On EU cost sharing, the debate you know, continues to be difficult. Um, we've had some effect in pushing back um, ISOC and our allies on some of the proposals, and we've seen some changes in Europe. Um, just this past week with the policy uh, makers that we had here, we had a comment that you know, ISOC came in really strong on that. That was refreshing. 
So um, I think um, there's a moment where um, our voices is welcomed in, in debates like this and they value the kind of analysis that we're, that we're doing here. And this, I think, will set us up for 24 quite well. Next slide. Global Encryption Day, of course, happened um, a few weeks ago in October. Um, we're always proud of this um, event. It's our rallying point in the year um, for our advocacy on um, encryption. There's a lot on this slide. Um, it's just a lot of activity and, and work that goes into this throughout the year, uh, working with the Global Encryption Coalition um, and and putting our, our, our marker down that this is important, that, this, um, that the work that we're doing, um, you can see the theme here, encryption makes people powerful. Um, the, this was based on feedback from the community that um, you know, this needs to be an inclusive, um, that the wording we use around encryption needs to be inclusive and it needs to be empowering for people. And I think that's consistent with some of what we've heard from, from the board as well. Um, we had a lot of good policymaker engagement on this, um, some good statements that came out um, of the UK, out of the White House um, and elsewhere. And um, that always sets the stage for, for advocacy going forward. Obviously, um, it's not an easy road on encryption around the world. Um, we continue to face a lot of challenges. Um, you know, Ofcom or the UK did um, pass the Online Harms Act. Um, but they have also opened conversations with stakeholders on now what to do with it. So we are at least in the room and in that conversation. Um, and, um, you know, we had a lot of, I think the other thing I would just point out here, over 70 events globally on Global Encryption Day, um, 47 by our ISOC chapters, um, primarily in Africa and LAC. Um, so I think that was really positive engagement. Next slide. Uh, the IGF um, was uh, recently, I saw a number of you there um, in Kyoto. Um, our focus there, we had a, a small but mighty delegation and focused primarily on um, community engagement. Uh, we had the ISOC reception um, sponsored the youth ambassadors. And um, with Barry's help, we launched the 2030 community um, consultation um, at the reception there. So thank you for that. Um, we were in a number of sessions, both in person and remotely, um, and 16 bilateral meetings um, with members, governments, and partners over three days. It was exhausting. Um, but um, actually, it was really good engagement opportunity. The UN work is picking up, um, and there was um, a lot to be learned in that environment. So um, it, was, it was good to be there. Yep. Yeah, I have seen in the uh, many events the presence of ISOC, which is really encouraging. Uh, uh, just one point, when we compare what other organizations do at those events, we, we, we may take care on the um, kind of stand that we, we put that at least delivers a lot of information to people attending the event. Uh, I think it was in the... Um, IGF, I cannot remember, but it was just simple table, not even with a with with a sign that well here's ISOC. It was just a plane and uh, the empty table. What I, what I saw in a photograph, yes. But the uh, maybe we should just take care on those things. Well, thank you. All right, next slide. Uh, empowering people to take action. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is just a highlight of um, uh, the Paraguay chapter um, that has been doing some, some fantastic work um, for a number of years. They have a particular interest in connectivity, uh, rural connectivity, a focus on linking schools. Um, and through their work, they've been funded by the Internet Society. Um, they have a number of other partnerships. They took something that was relatively small and are now recognized at the national level as a real partner to the government and other stakeholders um, that are that work and care about connectivity in that country. Um, so it's an example of um, uh, of a chapter that's that's really positioned itself well in the country um, and is looked to um, for expertise on on a number of topics. This last bullet here comes from Nancy, who's our chapter engagement manager um, and. I, I thought it was just nice, so I pasted it in there. But the trajectory of the Paraguay's chapter's growth paints a picture of how a chapter with the right support and vision 
can evolve and carve a niche for itself within a nation's landscape over time, which I thought was really nice. And they do some great work there. Next slide. Um, about this time last year, I want to say it might have been at the board retreat, the board asked us to, to think differently a little bit about how we do our youth ambassadors program and to expand it um, to include events, uh, not just the global IGF, but also um, regional IGFs and um, uh, RightsCon, which we did this year. Um, and I want to say that it was um, actually really successful. Um, we had um, ambassadors at the African IGF, Eurodig, RightsCon, and the global IGF. I think I'm getting that right. Um, There's a little bit of friction. Uh, people wanted to go to the global IGF exclusively at first. Um, but what we learned um, from this was um, from a number of the fellows that they actually got a lot out of the smaller regional events, that there was more opportunity for engagement. And um, in a way, you're in a bit of a smaller pond so that you can have um, bigger impact. Um, so that's a, a model that will carry forward. And I wanted to make sure I came back to the board and reported on that. Next slide. Oh, we have a video. I didn't actually know that worked. That's OK. <laughs> um, I put this in the Slack channel earlier, but we launched the donate page. Um, I think it's, it's important to call this out. This is going to be an important piece of our fundraising effort going forward. And it took a lot of work by a lot of different teams across legal and finance and systems and, and, the, and the fundraising team and so on. And so this, um, we're really happy that this is live and working and we'll keep building on that. Next slide. All right. So this okay. is, um, oh yeah. Charles has his hands. Oh, I'm sorry, Charles, I didn't see it. No, sorry, uh, it's okay. Uh, uh, the slide before this one, uh, yeah, uh, I just want to uh, say a quick thing about uh, all these events that we have uh, uh, representatives, either ambassadors or staff going to, uh, because I, I keep hearing sometimes from friends or, or chapters, sometimes that they said, I saw was not present in this event and that event. And I said, well, there should be people there. But uh, so I guess what, what I am trying to say is, let's see if, if there are ways that we can uh, well, well, make sure that more people know that we are there. Uh, we may not have a big booth. We may not do even do a booth or we may not, you know, be visible like, 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 like whatever ways people would find it to find us to be visible. But I just wanted us to maybe think about how to, to make sure that we are more visible, uh, telling people that we are in these events and they can approach us or discuss with us if there's any interest or whatever. But keep on, sometimes I keep hearing this from uh, people saying that we're not present, but I do believe that we are. So that's just what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. I think uh, Andrew wanted to respond. Uh, thanks for that, Charles. I mean, it is the case that we've had, we've been operating under a more restricted travel budget. And so we've had to spread our resources um, across the globe. And so it's possible that people have said we weren't at certain events. Um, uh, that we're hoping will be different next year, that we will um, be able to engage more um, with the community. But I, I think your point is well taken. The other, you know, focus that we have is when we send staff out, we want to make sure that they are reaching out to the local chapter, that they're reaching out to, to other members or partners that we may have wherever it is that they're going. And we're continuing to try to, to do that better. I covered my thing. And uh, so there is one more thing that I would say about this though. When, when you hear from somebody, you know, ISOC wasn't there, ask a little harder what they mean. Because some of the times what I hear is, oh, you know, the Internet Society didn't show up at this event. And then I'm like, no, no, but we had four people there. And then they, yeah, but that was only four people. So what they're actually saying is, I want a delegation of 30. We do not have the resources for that. We just don't. And if people say, you know, you need to send more people, I would encourage you to use that opportunity to say, well, the donate button is available on the website and then we will have more resources to be able to, um, uh, to do this. Because it's, it, it is not always the case that what people are saying is that we literally were not there, but rather that they're, you know, they, they think that we didn't have as, as many people and, and 
often what I hear is, well, you know, ICANN had a very large delegation. I'm like, yeah, sure they did. They also have, you know, a lot more money than we do. Yeah, uh, 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 Andrew, point taken. But I think uh, you and I may have been been meeting different kind of people, but those two are telling me that probably really think that we weren't there. But uh, I take your point that, uh, yeah, we can make use of any opportunity to tell people to donate more. I take that. But uh, yeah, thank you. Yes, um, thank you. So uh, I, I, I'm looking at it, this from, from a perspective that I've attended a couple of meetings um, that maybe this kind of scenario also might have played out. Um, but I look at it from the perspective that do we even have, take for example, marketing materials such as this sticker, right? I'm just giving an example with this. Um, I've actually, by the way, I've been looking for this sticker for a very long time to just put behind my laptop. Um, and not having maybe something as basic as this, maybe there are ISOC staff there and they're not having marketing materials, probably even in the booth or something to encourage people. People want to have some sense of affiliation, right? They want to have a sense. And sometimes when they take your branding materials like this, right? They just want to stick it on and say, hey, I'm part of ISOC. I know what it means for us sometimes to get this kind of stickers at the local chapter and then we give it to our members. It gives them some sense of belonging that they are part of something. It's more like you just give them a certificate that they went to school for four years, right? Just to be a member of ISOC, right? That's how strong your marketing, marketing material was doing a whole lot of work from way back, right? But we haven't even seen some of these things around, right? And at least um, I attended the, the ICANN meeting and it was probably at the, the, um, the, the ISOC, uh, what do they call it now? The, the, the one we had socials that we, I got to see, and I knew that there were ISOC member, uh, staff members around, but I probably didn't maybe see them drop some of these things around for people to even know that ISOC is within um, the space at all. So it, it's just, I'm not saying anything that is being done is, is it's bad at the moment. I'm just saying we can try to improve more on it and try to at least tell our stories with little or tiny things like this. Yeah, it, maybe it's that the point I was I was trying to point out about the it, it's about the perception and the presence of people. We know there are people there. We get a lot of emails uh, about well, it's going to be Icon in Hamburg. There will there are four ISOC staff members around there, but where do they are? Who they are? They, uh, that's what people ask, and especially I find or I get uh, communications from young people asking, where is, why is ISOC not here? And then we, we may say, well, yes, you, you know, there is a staff there, but how do we identify them if they're coming plain and civilian clothes? Yes, the, uh, well, they, we, we need to work on that thing, uh, yes. And, and as Andrew said, well, the, uh, if we want to go and say, press the button, well, the, uh, maybe we need a button saying, press the donate button or something like that. But the, uh, we cannot ask for money if we are not showing what we are doing, yes? And we only want to show what we will be doing with your money, yes? So the, uh, I think it's uh, uh, in part marketing, but it's part taking care of the resources we have in the community. And the last thing is, well, maybe we should work, work with the local chapters, yes, to, to improve those relationships. Yes, I was very surprised about the, the uh, and gladly surprised about the email you sent with, with the information from the local ISOC uh, guy who gave us a guide uh, what to do in Prague. Yes, I know it's unrelevant for our mission, but it's relevant in terms of community building. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ted, sorry, just a quick follow up to that question, uh, to that earlier comment, I, remark I made. Um, take, for example, even when you put some of those stuff 
probably at um, um, ISOC um, stands and stuff like that. Um, put in a very big signage that says, you can also donate to ISOC here, right? Like a QR code, putting it there, maybe at those kind of meetings, right? Is also something good for us to even say, hey, um, we spent this amount of money here to bring staff members here. And during this meeting while they were there, they, they put out this QR code um, on the ISOC stand and then it brought this amount of money in. It's it's something that we can we can refer back and say, hey, this is a good return on investment. Right. So it's just suggestions anyway. Um, um it's it's an operational thing for you guys to take up if you choose to, but if not, it's an advice. So yeah, we, we do, as uh, Luis got to at the end of what you said, the, uh, we, we do look to the local chapters. There was quite a large reception um, in Hamburg that was, there wasn't a lot of ISOC staff, but there was plenty of participation from the Germany chapter, and they helped arrange this thing. Uh, Caleb and I both spoke there and got people to fill out the surveys and so on and so on. So um, when we don't have local chapters to rely on, as Andrew said, we have limited resources to send people, but we do call on the chapters and it works. Um, so this is good feedback. You know, we are, like I said, we're, we're, there's going to be more um, opportunities for ISOC to engage with the community next year. And, um, you know, we'll take this, this on board for sure. So thank you for that. Um, this is just the last slide. And I said I would come back to this at the end. Um, obviously, you know, we've done a tremendous amount of work. You saw a lot of that um, in these slides. Uh, we also went through something, you know, difficult with the reduction in force. And we've been looking at, um, you know, how is that going to impact on our ability to deliver on the action plan through the remainder of the year? Um, and so, you know, this is the, the assessment um, right now um, of where we think we are. Um, some of these, you know, we're looking to see if we can mitigate, but others, um, you know, we, I, I told you, I think in, in September that we would probably come back and, and give a realistic assessment of um, the implications for us. Um, we have roughly 10% fewer people. So, um, you know, it's just going to affect our ability to get certain things done. And with that, I wrap up Q3. Sorry, any questions before we move into the action plan? All right. From backward looking to forward looking. Okay, I'm happy to present to you the um, Internet Society Action Plan 2024. Next slide. Uh, this is an overview. Um, I think just stepping back, um, you know, Ted, you were saying this last night at dinner, um, the internet that um, we all care about, that's part of our mission, that we believe is a force for good in the world, is, is under threat across the globe. It is, um, we see policy and business decisions um, undermining the internet um, all over the place. We see this underlying lack of trust in the internet. And yet we still have over 2 billion people in the world that are not connected. So there's a lot of work for the Internet Society to do. And we think our, our mission is as relevant and as important as ever. Um, so this action plan is organized around the work that we will do to advocate and defend the Internet, um, the ongoing work we do to build and improve um, the Internet's resilience, um, scaling our impact through mobilization and capacity building, um, and sustaining the health of our organization and programs overall. Next slide. So we are committed to advocating to defend the internet. Um, I suspect a lot of you are hearing about um, more and more activity happening in the UN um, with respect to the internet. I think the internet policy space in the United Nations is picking up pace once again. Um, the Internet Society has been long time, has for many, many, many years been engaged in the Internet governance discussion and the defense of the multi-stakeholder model. Um, but there are processes both in New York with the Global Digital Compact, 
um, in Geneva with WISIS Plus 20 and then the ITU's World Telecom uh, Standardization Assembly that are happening um, next year that cause us to say that we really need to um, step up our efforts in this area. We won't do this alone. We have very strong partnerships in the internet technical community that we will work very closely with on this um, uh, to try to inform these processes and be a strong advocate for the internet um, uh, in, on, on a number of different levels, both global and regional. We have some resources to bring to the table, the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit and the ITU um, Proposal Matrix, which has become a, um, a frequent uh, deliverable for us. Um, to try to inform the positions of at least five delegations. Um, we will also um, do a lot of advocacy and aim to get pro-internet language adopted in at least 10 public documents. And so, um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I immediately no. want to leap in to, to say uh, yes and. Yes and. Uh, this is definitely uh, important and good and not actually even close to where we're seeing all the threats in the governance space. I mean, uh, my biggest question in, in reading this is how much of this can we leverage into tools that we can use in regional policy, like the current Trilat uh, negotiations going on, I guess probably they're ended by, by now, uh, for the Quack CIDS issue or the ongoing, you know, should we be listening to everybody's messages as they pass uh, for CSAM, et cetera. Um, to some extent, the ITU's ponderous um, processes are an advantage to us because there's a lot of time uh, in the way their process is built for consultation and for the different nation states to come together, where some of these other proposals are rapid response problems where we find out on a Tuesday that there's some horrific piece of legislation coming down and we need to mobilize very, very rapidly. And I'm a little bit worried that this is front and center since the pace that we have to work with with the UN may be greater than the pace of any of the other threats. So I'd like your thinking on that. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fair. Um, the fact that this is first is not make it sort of first among equals in the in the in the work that we're gonna do. There is, I think it's two slides down, um, the work that we're doing on basic just defend and advocacy, which um, is coming out of the fragmentation project this year. I, there is a strong connection between what we do at the national level and the direct advocacy, the you know rapid response. Sometimes it's, it's sustained engagement, sometimes it's rapid response, and what's happening in the UN. None of these countries come to the UN um, with a blank slate, right? They're coming from their national policy environment. And so there's an interplay between the two. And I think ISOC has to be able to play at both levels. Is that responsive to what you're asking? Uh, I, I think it is, but I, I, I think you're talking about the countering emergent threats yeah. slide yeah, a couple yeah. of things down. And I think I, I wanted to highlight two things uh, there. One is in the defend, defending the internet in the United Nations, you talk about the the proposal matrix and the internet assessment mm. as tools that you can use there. And mm -hmm. um, certainly the first of those is a tool that you can use in the um, the national context yes. or the regional context just as well. Yes. I'm not as familiar with the ITU proposal matrix to know whether there's something equivalent that you could build mm -hmm. for uh, EU or similar. But what I'm wondering is the extent to which we can try and make these defenses um, common enough, not just at the ITU and nation state level, but among the nation states, because there's a real contagion, mm. right? We see uh, the the bad idea um, <laughs> legislator visit one country after another with the same bad idea. Yep. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. And uh, you know, if we see what happened in in Korea as emboldening Etno to ask uh, the European Commission for uh, two, two bites at the apple for, for every packet that passes, um, we can see that as contagion if we like, right? But the responses are very similar, yes. whether it is contagion or not. And given our limited resources, I think we really need to build not just these rapid response or, or continuous engagement, but we really need 
replicatable processes yeah. as much as possible. Now, every political situation is different. You know, you're you're lobbying different people using different connections, but to the extent that we can make that kind of material common across all of the bad ideas that we're facing, um, we're going to see them again. Yes. If it turns up in Norway, it's going to turn up in Sweden. If it turns up in Denmark, it's going to turn up in Iceland. If it's going to turn up in, um, you know, Mozambique, it may turn up in Angola. So we, we really get to think about maximizing the effect of these by making common tools yes. where it's reasonable to do so. Um, and I would say on cost sharing, it goes from Korea to Aetna, probably to the ITU. So, um, I, 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 yes, um, yeah, Pe Bob, I, I take, I see your hand. I think you're exactly right. We, we can't scale to rep or to starting from scratch every time one of these threats comes up. And we know that. Um, and I think the interplay though, between what happens at the UN level and the national level and back and forth is um, possibly an advantage for us, given that we can see into both the national and the, the regional and the global levels, but we have to do it smart because we can't, um, we can't start from scratch constantly. To, to finish up on this point, I, I mean, this reusability is the reason we built the tools over the last several years, right, that, that we did. I mean, it's the reason we, we said, okay, we're going to do this fragmentation project and get, and get a thing out of that. It's the reason we built the impact assessment toolkit, and then we keep pointing people at it. It's the reason we took the uh, – we, we do those uh, impact assessments, and then we publish them because, for instance, this week – when there were all these questions about uh, about the cost sharing um, uh, discussions in Europe, it was very easy for us to say, "Okay, well, here is an actual test case of an actual one that's actually been published." And like, wouldn't you like to know what uh, what the result of that was? And they, it turned out, had all already read the Korean case um, study that we had because of that. So I, I mean, you know, we're we're not starting from scratch every time, but that is the reason we built these individual pieces over the past several years. No, I was just going to actually, Andrew, say that, um, A, it's being done, right, that it is replicable and that the ISOC content um, is being used globally as these things pop up with the contagion and they're actually being very effective because it is ISOC. So it's not perfect, right? It's still a work in progress, but we're already seeing the benefits of what's being done. Um, and to, to your point, I think we do need to build more on that, but we don't, we're not starting over and the team's not starting over because of the spade work that has been done, um, and the content that exists. Um, and you know, the, um, the work in Brazil, just as one example, um, taking work elsewhere, right. And using it in Brazil, right. In Portuguese with Anatel actually has made a difference. So, you know, this is, I mean, um, extremely important, powerful. Um, you know, there was an earlier discussion, I think, from Sarah about working with the UN and having the UN endorse what we're doing. But in fact, net net these days, the UN has a bigger problem than it is part of the solution. And I think we have to be really careful about what we are endorsing at the UN. Um, and it's not just the ITU. In fact, um, it's other parts of the UN and it's what the Secretary General has planned, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Any other interventions on this point? Okay. Uh, I, as I started out, this was yes and. I think this is good. I think the tools are good. I think all of this is good. I think the threats... Um, ramify across a bunch of these, and maybe we actually want to put the tool development, um, link it even more strongly to defending the internet um, in our description of the action plan. Because I, I think, as you rightly point out, you and Andrew both rightly point out, um, that's what's going to make that reproducibility not painful. The, the last comment I would say on this is the way ISOC is structured. Um, the teams that work on these things um, are also working on the national advocacy. So it's not one team over here 
dealing with this that we try to 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 cross reference as much as possible and we have to we're not we're not big enough to do it otherwise next slide uh one thing that we've heard over and over again is that um, as the policy threats um, um, add up, um, we're often in a defensive position, right? Um, and But there is important work to be done to have a more um, uh, foot forward approach to be um, and to have a more positive statement to make about, okay, if not this, then what? Um, and, and the discussion, of course, around internet intermediaries is picking up all over the world. Um, uh, EU and US, of course, are, are very advanced in this discussion, but everybody else is watching. Um, and what we would like to do here is work with the community to develop approaches to this, um, best practices or policy approaches um, that would be a positive step forward and not undermine um, the open and global internet and not undermine the ability of all the different players in the ecosystem um, uh, to work effectively in the internet. Um, so this will be done with a, through the policy development process. Um, so this will be very open, um, out in the open. And the idea again is, is more of these tools that we have at our disposal with our advocacy. Um, and in this case, to have a positive message on this topic, um, and not constantly just, uh, um, we're saying no. Um, and so please watch for that because we're going to need a lot of expertise in order for this to work well um, from national experts, legal expertise, uh, technical expertise um, as well. Next slide. Um, uh, our work on encryption will continue because the bad ideas and the threats keep um, uh, growing. <laughs> um, so we're not going to let off our energy here um, and uh, continue to work uh, very closely to bolster the role of the Global Encryption Coalition um, so that we have a community of voices standing together to defend encryption across the world. Um, we're paying particular attention and working quite closely with the child safety community uh, right now. Obviously, child safety issues are one of the big places where um, encryption threats um, come up because people use um, child safety as, as a reason to, um, to ban or undermine end-to-end -end encryption. Um, and we want to work with the experts in this field. We are not child safety experts. They are. Um, and um, trying to give them um, the tools, the encryption tools to speak effectively about this um, is um, something that we've started this year and will continue into next year. Um, and again, we wanna work with policymakers and keep up the pressure on um, uh, making the statements and hopefully proposing and enacting um, favorable policies um, towards encryption next year. Next slide. This was the, the, the activity that I mentioned earlier, um, really more focused at the, at the national level, um, where we see that there's a need to, for sustained advocacy in certain markets um, where the threats are sort of continuing, um, and then also be able and agile enough to respond to the un unanticipated threats as they come up. Where, you know, as you said, Ted, on Tuesday, you're, you know, we understand this legislation is starting to move. So we want to be agile enough to do that. And to do that, you have to have the foundations. And that's what we've been um, trying to build. So we've got to get ourselves organized to pull that off. Um, we won't do this alone. This is work that we are fully committed to doing with um, members, in particular partners and other supportive, um, supporters of ours. Um, so that this advocacy is effective. This doesn't work if it's if it's just ISOC staff. Um, and I think you know the examples of Brazil and other markets are really ones where um, it's been a partnership, particularly with I think in Brazil the, the chapter there is 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 really outstanding. Next slide. Um, we have, uh, I think, as you're aware, engaged in something called the Amicus Program, um, really getting some very positive feedback on that um, and um, the need for us to speak up um, on behalf of the Internet um, in cases where um, we think we can have an impact. Um, and we're going to aim again to file at least two briefs um, in U.S. courts next year. Um, and then I think the thing, place where we want to do better is driving awareness of what we're doing in this space 
ensuring that uh, we are seen as a thought leader um, uh, when we when we make these submissions um, with the community, with impacted stakeholders and other um, legal thought leaders. Um, Because I think this is a a program where we can really position the Internet Society well. And I think we need to we need to do that better next year. Next slide. We have been long supporters of NDSS and will continue to do that. And um, uh, we, our aim is that NDSS remains a top five premier academic research conference, um, and that will be hosted in February of 24 um, on schedule. And um, uh, that's a, a conference that, that you know, really advances uh, state-of-the-art security research, and we want to continue to be supportive of that. Next slide. Uh, while we will not um, be managing the manners um, work in 2024 and beyond, um, we want to ensure that this transition to the Global Cyber Alliance goes well and smoothly. And so we are keeping a marker in our plan to ensure that, that we do the pieces that we need to and take the steps we need to take to ensure a smooth uh, transition of the manners secretariat to the GCA. And of course, we'll remain very active in the manners community and continue um, our advocacy in support of routing security. Next slide. Our work to build the internet and improve its resilience. we will, uh, you know, we remain um, strong advocates for this community uh, model of connectivity, um, and we will continue our work to support community networks. Um, we have a plan to build or improve six community networks in 24. Uh, the real focus next year is on uh, scalability of this work. Um, we have produced um, a toolkit um, for how to deploy community networks. We have training resources available. We have financing Uh, toolkits available, and we will launch um, the policy and advocacy toolkit next year so that a community that um, wants to deploy this kind of network infrastructure and wants um, to embark on this path has the resources that they need um, at their fingertips. This is, again, about scaling this model. Next slide. Uh, we will, uh, in 24, we will support, um, continue the support for internet exchange points. We will um, be supporting enhancing one uh, or building one and establishing one, excuse me, and enhancing five um, next year. Uh, one thing that we want to do um, is to monitor the traffic to ensure that, um, you know, these IXPs are in fact causing traffic to be exchanged locally. Um, and there's some measurement work that we have to do to make that happen. Um, Uh, As I mentioned earlier, um, our support for peering events is not just to have events. It's uh, to support the peering ecosystem and the participants in that ecosystem um, and to nurture those relationships that make that work. Um, And so we're going to monitor attendance at these events to ensure that we're getting the right kind of participants and that they still find value in these events because, you know, they're expensive and we want to make sure that that is still serving a need in those communities. And then finally, we are going to continue our steps to transition our role as the organizer of AFPIF um, to the African IXP Association. Um, They will shadow us as we prepare AFPIF next year. um, And our aim is to sign the transition agreement with them um, next year, which will get us um, on the path um, for a full transition in 25. Next slide. Um, as I as I said earlier, we're re- extremely proud of Pulse and um, and the and the way we've been able to present data that we think is useful for the community. And um, again, really appreciate the feedback we've gotten on that. We want to ensure that it's getting um, picked up around the world because part of our goal is to inform good um, journalism about the internet. Um, and um, so that's something that we want to make sure that we do. Part of that is that we are fully aware that we need to improve the interface and user experience of Pulse. Um, And so we're going to invest in that next year. Um, And then we're also going to continue the research fellows um, program. We started it this year. They haven't yet published their research, so I can't report it to you yet. But um, there was a lot of interest in that. And and we really feel like it's it's something that we can do to promote um, sort of measurement research um, and, and make that more widely available. Luis, I saw your hand. Oh, and Victor. Well, if we look at the uh, at the numbers of the uh, references in the indexes related to Internet Society, we we, we find about three thousand 
mentions a year. Yes, in um, academic uh, pub uh, publishing. Yes, so I feel that Pulse, which is maybe one of our more scholarly uh, produced research, uh, it has to be published more. The, the, the products of research ha have to be published in order to be in increasing the the reference to the internet society because it for in comparison the IGF uh, this year has had more mentions than the what we did in the in the last year yes so the um it's, it's just an academic measure sorry my brain works slow the previous slide you had talked about the IXP side and measurements do you have, I mean, obviously that's a challenging thing to deal with, and I'm sure you're spending a lot of cycles on it. Do you have goals in terms of some kind of qualitative or quantitative outcomes you're looking for, or you, just, or you still feel like you're in the baselining phase of what does it mean to be successful here and what does success look like? No, we've actually um, published something on this. I can send it around. Um, in the markets that we can measure, that we are choosing to measure, we're aiming for, um, they call it 50-50, 50% of, of traffic exchange locally. So it's it's a goal. Um, and, you know, when we can do the measurement, then we can evaluate whether the steps we're taking is moving us closer or farther. So there is some baseline work that's been needed. And that's actually been slower this year, um, in part because of the, the staff reduction. But um, the team is really interested in learning from that. Um, so yes, we're we're gathering the data, and there is a there is a goal, and I'll, I'll send it around. Okay. Uh, scaling impact through mobilization and capacity building. Um, next slide. I'm always a little reluctant to. We, we group these things together, but I, I think it's really important and we've made a lot of strides over the last couple of years to ensure that the work we're doing on mobilizing and building our community is, is not separate from the project work that we're doing, um, that these things really do come together. So while they're listed here in a separate slide, you really um, should look at these as integrated across, um, across the projects and, and other activities. Um, we want to, we need a strong um, community. Um, that is how the Internet Society as a global community will build and defend the Internet for future generations. Uh, so we um, are going to focus this year on mobilization. Um, if we're going to undertake this kind of advocacy that we spoke about, both at the national level and the global level, we've got to have a community um, that can, that can uh, work together to do that. Um, so we want to see um, at least 25% of our org members and 60% of our chapters advocating to uh, protect the internet next year. Um, oh, yeah. How are we going to measure that? Uh, this is um, for the chapters. We actually can do that because we have a lot of um, information gathering. We're, we have a new person um, who's joined the Internet Society to drive our org member engagement. And you'll see in that um, one, two, third bullet down that. We know we have work to do to um, improve our engagement with org members overall. And we um, are hopeful that through things like the Global Encryption Coalition or Global Encryption Day or standing with us in the UN work that we can see um, our org members um, uh, carrying that advocacy. Okay, so the, the measure will be they sign a letter that we propose, it they join an encryption event that yeah. has an external rather than, so not a learning event, but one with an external advocacy right. thing, they support some piece of work that, that we measure that we produced. Right. But we're not gonna try and measure whether they're advocating uh, to protect the internet in any fashion that's unlinked to ISOC's efforts. Oh, yes, yes, correct. Okay, yes, so that's right. I, you don't get to automatically count Cisco because yeah. we're, you know. Okay, no. I just I just wanted to know how we're measuring it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's a fair point, yeah. Luis. But Encryption is only one thing. Uh, which other actions we are proposing them to protect the internet? Well, there's a whole host of things that um, could go on throughout the year. I think Ted alluded to there are letters sometimes that go around that organizations can sign, and we we've offered those up um, to the community periodically. 
there may be um, opportunities, and we see this at times where an organizational member will say, you know, hey, look, this Internet Society position on this topic is really useful. You should take a look at it. And we do see that. We get that kind of feedback from our org members. Um, so, yeah, it is linked to the Internet Society, though. I, I, I worry about it in part because I think it may be invisible to you a lot of the time it happens. So an example here is Cisco, uh, as a corporation, um, signed the letter that Mozilla put forward uh, about uh, EITAS. Um, but the persuasive documents I sent around were mostly ISOC documents, not Mozilla's documents, because the explainer from ISOC was a little bit easier for the folks who had to agree to that to understand and agree with. So. Um, you may find that this is a little bit hard to measure unless you build a channel for OMAC members to tell you when they've done that sort of thing. And that's my OMAC hat firmly on there for a moment instead yep. of my chair hat. And that, I think, is why that third bullet is really so important, that we need to, um, and we know this, um, improve the information flows and the dialogue between um, Internet Society and our org members so that we pick up on those things. Caleb, yeah. So, do we have any plans for growth for um, OMAC, uh, specifically introducing new small players? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, obviously you see here that we have a focus on retention as we get to the, um, uh, sorry, the fundraising slide, which I think might be next or two more down. Um, no, oh gosh, there's a lot more. So while that is going on, so basically yeah. the, 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 the question is, yes, you're speaking about retention here. But we I'm do want to grow it. talking about growth and introduction okay. of new yes. small players. Yeah. Okay, Andrew's pulling it up. Uh, yes, part of the goal here is to build a stronger pipeline of um, organization members that will then come into OMAC. That is part of what fundraising team is working on and our org member team. Andrew has, has more... You want to say more about that? So if you, I mean, this was really in the foundation um, uh, report, but uh, I, I mentioned earlier there was this, um, uh, there was this uh, um, narrative that the fundraising team put together um, uh, for the goals over the next um, little while. And so there is a modest um, uh, growth on, um, intended in that um in that team but for the next year uh we don't anticipate that it will actually grow because we've got to stop it from shrinking first so um we've we've got to turn it in the opposite direction and the first thing to do is this uh retention um effort because the it, it, and it's 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 couched here in terms of um, retention of organization member revenue uh, that's because um there are two things that are happening we're having a reduction in the number of participants, but we also have reduction in the, number, in the levels that people are signing up for. So some people don't leave as org members, but they change the level that they support us at. And that has been falling. Um, uh, so we need to turn that around. Okay. So do we have like a um, specific number to the attrition level of maybe? That, that's what this is. This is the 80% um, uh, member revenue. Um, that's, that's, what that, that's what that's for. Okay. So... Let me refresh again. What what I'm trying to ask is, like over the years, you say there is an attrition from OMAC members, right? Yeah. So, so what happened? Um, there there are two things that happened here, right? Because we because of the ITF LLC creation, there were a number of members who were part of the Internet Society who were really who were really supporting the ITF. And so um, we've we've sort of come through that period now, where we you know where we know what that is, but in the meantime, we also had considerable shakeup in the org member staff um, side. And so we have um, we we have a new strategy, which is based on somebody um, who is working on uh, working with the OMAC and working to support organization members. Um, and so organization members have have had a lot of contact with her over the last um, while and, and she has a plan and that's really about member service and making sure that they're active. And, and then on the, on the fundraising side of the house, they have responsibility for sort of bringing new ones in, in collaboration with, um, uh, with, with the member group. You can think of this as 
uh, a little bit like in, in a commercial environment uh, where you have uh, salespeople and you have account executives. And so, so the member services stuff is really like the account management um, and the new sales are, are, are like fundraising. Okay, so <clears throat> I, I see like an interplay between OMAC members, possibility of the growth, and IETF here, right? Um, possibly we have potential OMAC members who take more of their support to IETF, right? And the possibility that if we do like an outreach also to them and tell them, hey, yes, we know that um, this is ITF, you're supporting ITF, but it's not just ITF you can support. Um, you can also get some value-based um, um, uh, proposition by also being an OMAC member um, if you participate also as OMAC um, here as well. So what I'm suggesting is finding an interplay between um, some maybe smaller players or big players that are already within the ITF space uh, supporting the work of ITF and how we can also get some of them to maybe those who are not part of OMAC before join the OMAC and maybe it will also, I know that you're working on the retention part, maybe it will also increase the growth and then you just add them up to retention. It's just um, like I keep saying, it's an advice. Um, um, if it's something you can look into. So, so I, I, I think our efforts within the community that we already know are sort of, you know, that vein is tapped pretty, pretty well. I think the, the place for growth actually in, in the org membership is really parts of industry that have not, that we have not appealed to before. So our problem is, you know, for instance, we don't have any insurance companies who are members of the Internet Society. And yet insurance companies are now like completely dependent on the Internet and, the, and its existence in order to achieve their business. We have a very small number of financial firms. Um, uh, there's just a couple. Uh, and yet, you know, financial firms are like really dependent on uh, on on the Internet and in particular, uh, you know, really have to worry about about efforts to weaken encryption um, because, um, you know, banking is over if encryption gets weak. So, I, I, you know, we have we have appeals that are being structured that way. And the fundraising team is working on growth in, in that way. In fact, um, next week I'll be at the Web Summit and one of our fundraising team is going to be there with me um, uh, to, you know, have some of those meetings and so on. But I think I, I, I think it is very tempting for us as an organization to look at communities that we're familiar with and try to try to you know raise more money out of them or to try to get more participation out of them and i think you know participants in the itf for instance are not are not mystified about what the internet society is we know them all um it's it's easy to it, it's easy to get hold of them and you know they're making choices based on what is valuable for uh, for their organization every now and then we have some success with one of them who is you know, wandered off a little bit, and we're we're able to get um we're able to get them um to rejoin us. I mean, Cisco is an example of that. Um, uh, but um, uh, I I think if we're really going to go after growth, we've got to go after growth in in places where we have not been reaching before, and that is consistent with my view about fundraising. We spend a lot of time, you know, sort of fretting in our fundraising discussions about public support and so on, because that's an urgent and pressing issue for us. But the truth of the matter is we need to raise funds, not just because of public support. We need to raise funds because we just don't have enough money, right? Our budget across the combined organization is like $50 million a year. And we've got 150 people and 100,000 volunteers. That's roughly the size of, of, of our effort. The people we are aligned against are nation states who can literally print money and the best capitalized corporations in the history of capital. This is a completely unfair fight right now. And we have to find more resources to, in order just to cut through the noise. Um, and and that's, that's, that's the reason that, that you know, the fundraising team is getting driven by me towards you know, ever greater heights because what they're hearing um, is, is you know, how urgent this problem is. And I think that the org membership is part of that, both um, adding their voices to the Internet Society and collaborating with us in our activities, but also because the, the financial resources that they bring. 
So I hear you clearly about um, reaching out to the to those other players that has not been reached out to. Uh, but my emphasis is also still trying to reach out to those that we know internally and that we've built relationship with. Um, there is this conception that um, because Ted and Andrew are my friends, right? I would just, I need help with something, right? I would just say, hey, is it not just Andrew or Ted, right? It's something I can just gloss over, right? Uh, probably because I know you internally, right? But because of the fact that I have not even attempted to maybe use the relationship that I have with you to reach out again to you and say, hey, um, why don't we look at this from a different lens or a different perspective, right? And see how you can be of benefit to us and we can also be of benefit to you, proposing value to you, right? Um, it's just the suggestion that let's not also ignore the internal players that we are used to, right? We can still, even if it is something little, we can get out of them. And uh, it, like I keep saying, it's an advice, right? If we can still get something a little out of them, it's fine. If the focus is for the external players only, it's also fine, right? But I'm just saying that let's not also ignore that aspect out of the fact that we have the perception that we are very familiar with them and not exploiting that relationship. That's a better, for lack of a better word, I'm using the word exploit. Barry? So just keep in mind that to some extent, a lot of this for the organizations we're already working with is a zero sum game. We provide a number of ways that they can contribute and they, they can be chat, uh, uh, organization members, they can donate, they can donate to the IETF. From the IETF, there are various ways to donate through different focuses and they can host meetings, they can be diversity sponsors and whatever. But at some level, they have a certain amount of money that they're willing to give. And if you get them to give more over here, they're going to give less over there. So that's where reaching out to people who are not already giving us money is, is the real key here. Uh, otherwise, you're just shifting it around and, and, getting, and not getting that much. Okay, let's move on. Uh, let, let's come back to this later. I think we, we don't have a whole lot of time to get on to. Okay. Okay. Uh the Internet Society has long um, uh, championed the, or celebrated, I guess we should say, the, the, the people that have come before us to build the Internet, um, and we'll continue to do that. Um, one thing we want to try to facilitate um, is a connection between um, the people who are um, the award winners, whether it's the IHOF or the Postel Awards, um, uh, with our um, um, future internet leaders, the fellows, the ambassadors and the like, um, to try to facilitate that, that transfer of experience and knowledge. Um, we've also done some work with the Postel Award community on um, clarifying the criteria and the processes, um, and we'll aim to um, increase the number of nominations of strong candidates um, for that program by 10% next year. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Uh, our work to develop um, internet leaders is, is really um, an important way that we extend um, the impact of the Internet Society. And Andrew mentioned that in his overview of um, the foundation. Um, these are the people that um, come to us for training, for capacity building, who then go out and build and defend the internet in their local um, environment. We do that through our online learning um, platform, as well as through our fellowship programs. And, and we've been very pleased with how those have grown and developed over the years. Um, we want to maintain um, a 95% satisfaction rating from the learners and ensure um, an above industry standard of 30% completion rate of our uh, learning at ISOC courses. Um, we have a model that has proven to be quite successful, this train the trainer model. Uh, the chapters, um, particularly Zimbabwe and Mali, have um, been pioneering this, and this is something we want to replicate. Um, of um, people getting trained and then in turn going out and training in universities and their local um, uh, uh, communities. Um, and then 
the alumni program is something that's really quite important. If you do this fellowship program and then we don't remain in touch with the people that um, have come through it, then that's that's not a great success. So we're going to invest a lot of energy this year in um, building the alumni program um, and establishing a baseline of engagement so that we know that um, these fellowships um, are resulting in internet leaders that are, um, are, are active um, parts of the internet society going forward. Next slide. Um, the Policymakers Program, I think many of you are aware of, we ran it um, this week and we will continue to run the Policymaker Program um, in conjunction with the IETFs next year. Um, we will um, bring at least 20, I think a total of 21 um, policymakers into the program next year. Um, and we wanna ensure that it remains relevant and useful for them. And so we will be um, aiming for a 90% satisfaction rate with the program. Next slide. Finally, we can't do this um, without the uh, resources um, to make it possible. So we are focused, of course, on securing resources for growth and for greater impact. Um, in 24, um, as Andrew has mentioned, um, we are going to implement a multi-strand fundraising strategy to support the organization's fundraising goal of 6.2 million um, US dollars. Our goal here is to expand and diversify our funding sources um, by 20% of increase in new donors. Um, also, we want to strengthen and increase the pipeline of donors. So um, ensuring that we have this pipeline of new prospects. Um, you see here 145 corporate donors and 500 individual donors so that we have a sustainable um, funding approach going forward. Um, this is not the responsibility of any one team. Um, this is a, an ISOC-wide um, activity, and that is something that we have been uh, working very um, hard to achieve inside the Internet Society. This is an all of ISOC approach and that we want to engage our community in our fundraising efforts. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And that is Action Plan 2024. Luis. Yeah, thank you. Regarding the slide that we were talking about, the uh, the um, strengthening, the, the defending the, the internet, uh, I want to know why we're talking about 25% of the organizational members compared to the 60% of the chapters. Now, we're talking about a community that is formed at least from three big parts, the OMAC, the IETF, and the chapters. Why there is no measure for the IETF? Those are my two questions. Thank you. Well, I, I think with the IETF, they um, have to decide their appropriate level of engagement. I don't know that that's something that we can um, decide or obligate for them. As I, I think we mentioned, one of the things that, that I will be focusing on is ensuring that we have a stronger um, tie with the IETF, and particularly with the IAB, um, and that they are aware of the different policy opportunities for engagement, because I think they are interested that doesn't mean that they are going to be present and active in all the places that ISOC is. Uh, they can't, and that's not their remit. But there are moments um, where their voice is, is really strong and powerful, and, and they may not know that that opportunity exists. So we want to make them aware when we know, when they have opportunities and they have questions, we want to have that kind of seamless information. But I don't think we're in a position to measure ourselves against um, the activity of, of the IAB in particular. So uh, I suggest from what you've just said that the appropriate measure is making sure that we notify the IAB of appropriate policy things on a certain number uh, of times during the course of the year. That's measurable. It's our action. Their ch choice is still whether to respond or not. And the difference between the 25 and 60 for me, it sounds unfair because we tell the chapters what to do and then we measure if they did it. This is not a measure for the chapters. This is a measure for whether the Internet Society and the staff are, are identifying opportunities that the chapters find valuable. So this is not a measure for the good or bad of the chapter community. If we are identifying opportunities that are irrelevant, or that they aren't equipped to respond to, then we haven't done our job. 
Um, I think that 60% candidly is we've done a lot of work uh, with the community over the last several years to create a very strong foundation of chapters that want to be active. So if we at staff are giving them the right tools and resources, we should see you know, sort of easy activation of the things that they're interested in. I don't want this to be ISOC global telling the chapters what to do. The Paraguay chapter is active in community connectivity. That's great. That's where they want to be. And we want to be supportive of that. It's within our remit and our mission. The chapter in um, Brazil has a, a different set of interests um, and we want to support that. So I feel like that 60% is reflective of a pretty strong chapter community. The org member community, just going back, we have work to do there. We need to demonstrate value to our organization members so that they want to do these kinds of things, that they want to engage in this advocacy. We have work to do there. We have to rebuild some relationships. We have to open some dialogue and I think make the OMAC um, an increasingly effective place to do work. So it is a little bit lower. We have work to do. So maybe a fair statement would be, we expect it to go up over time. We expect that 25% to go up over yeah. time. Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> We're going to take a short break here uh, and we'll return in executive session to discuss uh, the, f the finance report and the budget. Um, in the meantime, let's return at the top of the hour. Uh, Charles, it's finally time to eat breakfast. Ah. We'll see you, see you in half an hour. Bye. Uh, just, just for folks to know, there there will be a couple of last minute changes to the board book. So if you're working off a downloaded PDF just before um, you come back, please re-download it um, because there'll be an updated text of one resolution for the end of the day. Thanks. Which point of the agenda? Uh, so it's related to a new point that Ilona uh, is bringing for the end of the day. Uh, okay. Approval. For a particular state of uh, I will add it under item eleven. Item eleven. Yeah, because it'll be on the kitchen tab. Which is the last of it? Uh, we return now to uh, an open to observer session after having re reviewed the finance committee report, the budget, and the PAR budget. Let me thank you, say uh, the work you and your team have put in to prepare this was substantial and is very much appreciated. We also thank the PAR uh, folks for the work they put into uh, preparing the budget for our review. Uh, we have a number of resolutions uh, related to the budget and finance and the action plan. Uh, the first one of which uh, reads, resolved that the Internet Society Board of Trustees approves the 2024 action plan and budget as presented. Are there any questions about this resolution? Uh, any discussion? Uh, seeing none, please uh, raise your hand if you are in favor of the resolution. <coughs> any opposed? Uh, because of a timing issue, Funke, I'm going to ask you to give a voice vote. Are you in favor or opposed? In favor. I raised my hand already. I'm not yes. sure if you saw it. Okay. okay. Thank I, you. I think network lag caused it to appear in the wrong place, which is why I wanted you to go by voice, but I think it's clarified. And uh, John, in favor or opposed? In favor. Thank you. Are there, uh, are there any abstain? Uh, seeing none, the... Uh, Resolution is approved. Uh, the next resolution is resolved that the Board of Trustees approves designating a total of $1,055,000 to be funded by the Connected Giving Foundation as a restricted grant for the board initiatives as outlined below. An additional $100,000 to fund the Internet Society Amicus Program, an additional $455,000 to fund the Digital Transformation Initiatives, and $500,000 to fund the Environmental, Social, and Governance Strategy. Are there any questions about the resolution? Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, if you are in favor of the resolution, please raise your hand. Yes, any? in favor. Thank you very much, Funke. Are there any opposed? 
and he abstained. Uh, thank you very much. With that, the uh, resolution passes. Uh, the next resolution is the approval of the Public Interest Registry budget, and it reads, Resolved that the Internet Society Board of Trustees hereby approves the 2024 budget of the Public Interest Registry as presented. Any, dis any questions about the um, resolution? Any discussion of the text of the resolution? Uh, seeing none, if you are in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Any opposed? In favor. Thank you, Funke. Any abstain? Seeing none, this also passes. Uh, the last resolution for today's business is actually uh, related to the Minnesota Charitable Organizational Annual Report Form. Uh, all of the U.S. states require us to file, to file these, and as it happens, the uh, great state of Minnesota requires a resolution. Uh, to approve the annual report form for Minnesota, and it reads, whereas ISOC maintains charitable registration status in the state of Minnesota, whereas as part of the charitable organization annual report form, Minnesota statute 309.52 subdivision three requires a board approved resolution approving the contents of the annual form, as well as stating the board is responsible for determining matters of policy, supervising the operations and finances of ISOC and certifying information supplied in the annual form is correct and complete to the best of the board's knowledge. Resolved that the board approves the contents of the annual report form and all supporting materials attached hereto as exhibit A and does hereby certify that the ISOC board has assumed and will continue to assume responsibility for determining matters of policy and has supervised and will continue to supervise the operations and finances of the organization and be it further resolved that the ISOC board further states that the information supplied in the annual report form and all supporting materials is true, correct, and complete to the best of our knowledge. Are there any questions about the resolution? Uh, the form of the resolution being uh, required by law. I don't think we can have any discussion of the text of the resolution, so I'll move directly to the uh, uh, vote. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Are there any opposed? Any abstain? Seeing none, uh, the resolution passes. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. We will uh, Adjourn for the day. We'll return uh, tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock UTC or 9 o'clock CET uh, for the ISOC Board of Trustees Day 2. Uh, thank you all for your time and attention, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.